Trek, Everglade Brides Book 4, by Ava Benton. Chapter 1 Tucker Do you ever get tired of being such an insufferable little kiss-up? I slammed the door to my brother's room behind me, and he jumped. Well, not really his room. The room he was staying in, as long as we were visiting the Everglade Clan's Miami headquarters. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Demon acts, as he narrowed his eyes at me. Demon. Not exactly his given name. That was my nickname for him. Damien is what he was named. But from the, the time we were little, he called me Trek, and one gave him the moniker Demon. Sometimes it was like looking in a mirror, but not right this second. Not when he had that snotty look on his face. It was enough to make me want to throttle the bastard. Yeah, yeah. I know, he's not a bastard. Not technically. But at this moment, he was behaving like one. I clarified it for him. Probably not as gently as I could have, but it got my point across. It means, everybody saw the way you kissed ass at that meeting. Nodding your head so hard every time Vincent spoke, I thought it was gonna fall off and roll across the floor. Seconding everything that came out of his mouth. Telling him what great ideas he has. I snickered. It's disgusting, Dean, and it's so fucking obvious. Give me a break, he muttered. So what if I believe in being nice to the head of our clan? Maybe you should start thinking of your place in the clan, too. It wouldn't kill you to make a few friends around here. I shook my head, blinking hard. Are you for real? Why would I want to make friends and think about my position in the clan? I've been thinking about that my entire life, or did you forget? You can't be Marcus's son and not think about your position in the clan. It's sort of impossible. I don't mean that. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in Chicago, suffering through the winter. I like it down here. This is where everything's happening. You're kidding. Do I even know you right now? I sat down on the big four-poster bed that was just like the one in my room. Have you talked to Dad about this? He shook his head. No, and I'll kill you if you say anything to him about it. So what? You're gonna kiss Vincent's ass for a while and see where it gets you. What about Jace? What about him? He shrugged. I didn't say I want to take Jace's place. I would like a position down here, is all. I want to find out my options. He looked me up and down. Don't you like it here? Yeah, sure. I like it here. But not enough to stay. Once this stuff with the East Wings is over, I can't wait to get back home. Though nobody, not even Vincent Everglade, knew exactly when things would blow over. It wasn't even a war yet, not exactly. There was a lot of tension, a few threats, some violence against odd clan members, the ones who decided to go out alone at night and start a fight mainly. Otherwise, we'd been here for a month and didn't have anything to show for it, yet. Maybe my twin wasn't wrong when he considered putting down roots. We might not have a choice, the way things were moving, slower than molasses in the midst of winter. He shook his head. Not me. The energy is so different. I'll give you that, I agreed. Chicago was vibrant and busy and exciting, and so was Miami. But Miami was hot, and not just in terms of temperature. The girls were sexier, the music was better. There was definitely a dirty, sexy kind of vibe that couldn't be found back home. I never thought my brother would be into that kind of thing, but then again, he usually found a way to surprise me. Just do me a favor, okay? His eyes hardened again. Don't screw things up for me down here. What's that supposed to mean? I rose to my feet, shoulder squared back stiff, folding my arms. It means, I don't feel like looking over and seeing you rolling your eyes when I'm talking during a meeting. You mean when you're kissing ass during a meeting? Let's just call it what it is, okay? His face went red. Fine. Then let me start calling you like I see you. You aren't contributing a damn thing down here. You're lazy, you sleep till all hours, you party all night long. What the hell is there to do? I sit around here in this freaking mansion and I'm bored half to death. 
I go to the meetings, right? And whenever Vincent needs me for anything, I'm there. I haven't let anybody down. And I won't. But why do I have to chain myself up inside this house in the meantime? It would look good for us is all, he sneered. I don't care about looking good for us. Didn't he get it? I'm not the kiss-ass you are. I'm sorry. He took a step toward me. And what will Dad think when he hears about this? I took a step toward him. He won't be half as pissed as when he finds out you're down here kissing ass, wanting to live in Vincent Everglades' house when this is all over. Don't. Say. A word, he warned. Every word popped off like a pistol shot. Fine. Then don't go running to Daddy, because I like to have a good time, either. I turned my back on him and left the room with another slam of the door. He was the only person in the world who found a way to make me want to throw him through a window almost every day. Back home, our father kept us in line. If he heard us fighting or saw any outward sign that we were at odds, he'd straighten us out real quick. No matter how many years had passed, no matter our age or how grown we were supposed to be, we were still the same kids at heart, always getting on each other's nerves. I went to my room, next to Demons, and took a quick shower in the private bathroom. I needed to get out of there. The walls were closing in on me. The house was big, massive actually, as big as the one we grew up in just outside Chicago, but it still wasn't big enough for me. I needed fresh air, new faces. People who didn't shift into animals at will. The shifter life was my life, the only life I knew, but sometimes it was all too much for me especially with the added pressure of living up to my father's good name and solid reputation in the clan. He didn't have to say it out loud before we left Chicago for Miami, in order me to know a lot was riding on our stay in Miami, and not just the outcome of the war with the East Wings. I didn't doubt for a minute that we could wipe the East Wing shit stains off the map if we decided to. But I would have to distinguish myself while we were doing it, that was the big thing for our father. I had to be sure Vincent and his son recognized how valuable our branch of the clan was. Maybe he should have sent Demon on his own, I thought as I soaped up. But no, Dad would never have allowed that. Since the day we were born, there was no getting rid of each other. We were together, whether we wanted to be or not. The thing was, Demon wasn't too bad when he wasn't acting like a tool. I couldn't believe my twin brother could be such a brown noser. Damien, I told myself. I needed to retrain myself to think of him as Damien. I knew it irritated him no end when I cock-blocked him by calling him Demon in front of girls. Not that he was a pussy hound, not really. But still, I busted up his game whenever I told Chicks his nickname was Demon and that he had restraining orders on him from every one of his ex-girlfriends. That part was a lie, but what the hell, it livened up an evening. I dressed in a light linen shirt and khakis, then slid my feet into leather loafers. I had to give my brother credit for one thing. He was right about the weather. I loved the warmth. It was such a change from what I'd normally be wearing at that time of year, and shifters didn't even feel the cold the way humans did. It was just that bad sometimes, though, up in Chicago. Plus, the hunting was much better year-round. In winter, animals naturally hibernated up north. They were more likely to come out and play down south. I had just fed the night before and thought I might have to before that night was out. Why waste the opportunity? But there were other priorities to be attended to first. With that in mind, I headed in the direction of the downtown area once I left the mansion. Nobody bothered to ask where I was going, since I was out almost every night anyway. I could be trusted. I wasn't looking for trouble. Just fun. It was a Friday night, meaning things were even hotter than usual. To somebody like me, who sensed things more acutely than a human did, it was overwhelming. The sounds, the smells, the energy. It was like a drug, one I couldn't get enough of. There was always something new to see or taste or feel. I was in the mood to taste and feel something all right, as my eyes fell on a group of girls crossing in front of my jeep. They walked into a club on a busy corner, 
one with hot Latin music pumping out through the open doors. As good a place to start as any. I pulled up to the curb, tossed my keys to the valet, and went inside. It was electric, bodies everywhere. The temperature seemed to go up the further I worked my way inside. So many people dancing, girls having fun, couples grinding together, everything in between. I noticed activity going on in the dark corners too, and felt something stir inside me. I could go for that kind of excitement. I only had to choose the lucky girl. There were plenty to choose from. I turned to face the dance floor while waiting for a drink at the bar. Girls as far as the eye could see. Every color, every shape, every size. All I had to do was pick my favorite that night. Whether or not the one I chose was interested wasn't a problem, since they were always interested. Never once had a woman turned me down, and never once was a woman sorry she hadn't. Nah. Not ego. Confidence. Then I spotted her. My girl for the night. Dark skin, yellow dress. She stood out from the others, almost as though there was a spotlight trained on her. Her long dark hair was shot through with purple. Just another thing that drew my eye to her as she danced and swung her hair over her shoulders. She was ripe as a peach and probably just as juicy. I licked my lips as I watched her dance. She knew I was watching too, that was the best part. The way she caught my eye every so often and swung her hips from side to side or ran her hands over her body to let me know she knew I was enjoying the show. And I was. My pants tightened until I was sure I'd break the zipper. I was glad my shirt was untucked to cover it. She caught my eye again as she swung around in a circle, and her head jerked almost imperceptibly. Outside, she said. Meet me out there. Let's take this party someplace else. Maybe I was imagining the last part, but the rest was clear from the look in her eye and her coy smile when I nodded. I looked around once I was outside, and caught sight of her crossing the street. I followed at a distance. Where was she taking me? My anticipation grew the further we walked. It never once occurred to me that I might not want to let her lead me like that. Not until we ended up in an alley three blocks from the club. She shrugged with a rueful smile and walked on as I came face to face with three hulking figures. I could just about make them out in the dark alley, even with my strong vision. Well, look who it is. An Everglade. The voice was snide, sarcastic. I wanted to break the neck of whoever it belonged to. Only as they surrounded me, I had a feeling it wouldn't be that easy. I let the shift come over me even though I was in public, even though I would have to run back to the house on all fours or risk walking around in public with no clothes on. Oh, so that's how you want to do it? One of them laughed. Fair enough. It all went black soon after that. Chapter 2 Rachel I pulled the elastic band out of my long blonde hair and gave it a toss with my hands once I was behind the wheel of my car. What a relief to finally be finished for the night. I waved at Suzanne, one of the nurses who'd worked my floor that day, before starting the engine. Just a few minutes, and I'd be home with the day off in front of me. Sweet relief. I drove around the perimeter of the hospital parking lot, noticing how empty it was in front of the ur. It wouldn't be that way for long on a Friday night. There were always accidents and overdoses on a Friday night. Par for the course in a hospital. Sometimes I wondered if certain people were born with a death wish. It sure seemed that way. You're just tired, I murmured to myself as I pulled out onto the main road. I needed a long, hot shower and a full night's sleep. Maybe even a full morning's. I chuckled at the thought, like I'd be able to do that. My body was on a strict schedule. I couldn't sleep in even when I wanted to. On the plus side, I never needed an alarm to wake up. I just somehow knew what time it was. Suzanne had asked before leaving what my plans were for my day off. I had tried not to laugh at her. I never had plans, not the way some people did. Other girls, the single ones without kids like me, did all sort of things, especially when a free day fell over the weekend. 
brunch with friends, shopping, a trip to get their hair or nails done, a day on the beach, a movie, dinner or drinks. What did I do? I caught up on laundry, reading and clearing out my DVR. Not that it bothered me, not really. Only sometimes, when I listen to the others talk about their interesting lives. Like just then. That very night. It wasn't easy, driving home on a Friday, knowing there was no one waiting at home for me. Not that I'd have any energy for them after a 12-hour shift, but still. It was the principle of the thing. The back roads were always empty, which was why I liked taking them so much. The less I had to deal with traffic after dealing with crowded hallways and needy patients all day, the better. I was an introvert, the kind of person who needed time to recharge after being in the middle of a crowd for a long time. Funny how I chose a profession that put me in constant contact with others. My instinct to help overrode my instinct to be by myself. I was so deep in thought and so tired from being on my feet all day, I almost didn't notice the mass of fur on the road until it was too late. Lucky for me and for it, I just had the brakes replaced. I slammed on the pedal with both feet and managed to stop in time. Holy shit, I whispered. My heart raced like a trip hammer while a wave of nausea washed over me from the sudden shock. I hadn't seen it until the very last second. What was wrong with me? I was driving down a back road in the middle of nowhere. I had to be more careful. Once I was sure my knees wouldn't buckle, I jumped out of the car and ran around to see what I had narrowly avoided running over. At first, I thought it was a dog. It looked like one. And it was bleeding, a lot. You poor thing, I whispered, sinking to my knees in front of it. I wasn't worried about it attacking me. It didn't look like it had the energy left to attack anything. In the glow of the headlights, things looked pretty bad. Fur was matted with blood in several places and its breathing was shallow. Did you get hit, baby? I murmured. Poor sweetheart. The animal lifted its head and looked me in the eye, and I realized I was kneeling in front of a wolf. What the hell was a wolf doing in the middle of Florida, right outside Miami? I had never seen one before, and I'd lived there all my life. I stood up and looked around. The road was otherwise deserted. Maybe it had been part of a pack, and once it was struck, the rest of the pack left it for dead. When I looked back down at it, I noticed it was still looking at me. Straight in my eyes. Like it was trying to communicate. No, that was stupid. I shook my head. I don't know what to do with you, I muttered. I can't leave you here, like this. I don't even feel right dragging you off the road. At least you won't get run over but you might die. I chewed my bottom lip. I didn't want that on my conscience. There was only one thing to do. I crouched down and stroked the wolf's head. There was a little blood by its snout, but otherwise the fur was clean there. I'll take you to the vet, okay? I know there's one not far from here that's open 24 hours. They'll take care of you. I frowned. Why am I telling you this? I'm wasting time. Still, even as I hurried around to the trunk to pull out the blanket I kept in my emergency kit, something inside told me I wasn't wasting time talking to it. Didn't animals understand things? I had seen dozens of videos on the internet where animals did amazing stuff like leading firefighters to a house fire or leading rescuers to someone who needed their help. They just knew things. That had to be the case with the wolf. It understood, I wanted to help. I spread the blanket in the back seat, then asked myself how I was going to transport the massive wolf into the car. I was used to helping my patients in and out of bed, but this was different. And still, the road was empty. There would be nobody to help me. Okay, I said, feeling like an idiot. We have to get you into the back seat. Can you walk? Can you help me? I slid an old pair of scrub pants under its shoulders, thank God I never cleaned out my trunk, and pulled until the animal was on its belly. It managed to get to its feet, whining a little as it did. Here we go. Let's get inside. I eased it up into the car and helped it settle in the back seat. It looked even bigger back there, stretched from door to door, its paws touching the backs of the front seats. 
it looked at me again, before resting its head. What am I doing? What the hell am I doing? All I wanted was to go home. I got behind the wheel and turned the car around, heading for the vet's office. It was a good five miles out of my way. Still, I wouldn't have been able to sleep that night if I knew I'd left an animal to suffer. It just wasn't in my nature to do something like that. How did you end up all the way down here? I ax, like I was expecting it to answer or something. And who could leave something as beautiful as you in the middle of the road? I swear people are animals. Worse than animals. I adjusted the mirror and looked into it to make sure the poor thing was still breathing, and it was. I turned my attention to the road. You should see some of the things I see, working at a hospital. The things we're willing to do to each other. I guess if we hurt each other, it's nothing to hurt an animal, right? I shook my head. I just don't understand it. I never have. I don't either. I screamed when I heard a man's voice from the back seat, and the car swerved wildly before I managed to straighten it out again. I pulled off to the side of the road and turned around in my seat. Where there had been a wolf there was now a man. A naked man. What the hell is happening? I screamed as I got out. No way I was staying in there. He managed to lift his head and look out the window. I need help, he whispered. I don't understand. How is this? It finally hit me. A shifter. He was a shifter. I had picked up a goddamn shifter, not a wolf. It all made sense. The thought made me tremble, and I wrapped my arms around myself. I had never known a shifter before, and this wasn't exactly the way I had pictured meeting one. I got back in the car, kneeling on the driver's seat to look at my patient. You weren't hit by a car, were you? Somebody did this to you. There were bruises all over his body, along with bite marks. He'd been attacked by someone or something. An animal? He nodded with his eyes closed. You're right. His voice was barely a whisper. I chewed on my lip until it hurt. I'll take you to the hospital. With all that bruising, something had to be broken. His ribs for sure but maybe something else. Maybe I shouldn't have moved him, but I didn't know what else to do. I might have made things worse, but damn it, I thought I was dealing with a wolf at the time. Not a person. No, hospital. He opened his eyes again, and they were the same dark eyes I had looked into out on the road, with the same understanding I had seen in them out there too. Please, he whispered. I could just imagine the way they would deal with him, if I took him in. I knew all of the doctors and nurses doing rounds in the ur that night, not that it mattered whether I knew them or not. Anybody would be surprised to see a shifter come in. I guess that would make things more complicated for you, I whispered. He barely managed a nod. Crap. We heal fast, he whispered. I'll be okay. I just... I need somewhere to rest for a while. Where can I take you? He moved his shoulder just enough that I could tell he was shrugging. Don't know where I am. How to direct you? Double crap. Can you tell me the address? His eyes went wide. No. Don't take me there. Where? Just number. He shook his head. I'll explain later. What am I supposed to do? Take you home with me. That would be just fantastic. Walking from the car into the house with a naked man. The neighbors would love it. Please? He stared at me. You're a nice person. Please help me. My mom did always tell me I would live to regret my instinct to help others. Okay. Just stay still back there. I tried to cover him as much as I could with the blanket. At least he was on his side, so he covered up the important parts. I could only hope nobody happened to see him back there as I drove through my neighborhood. Chapter 3 Rachel Okay. The coast is clear. I opened the back door and handed him another blanket from inside the house, which he carefully wrapped around himself before just as carefully climbing out of the car. When he was next to me, 
even though he wasn't standing up straight, his height was shocking. He dwarfed me, and I was roughly 5'7". It seemed silly trying to help him into the house, when he was so much bigger than I was. He made it as far as the couch, before he collapsed onto it. I'm sorry, he breathed, leaning his head back. Everything hurts. I looked out the front window, to be sure nobody was looking. The rest of the street was dark, for the most part. A few lights on and upstairs windows, but that was about it. Par for the course around midnight, on a street full of families and retirees. The quiet was what drew me to, to the neighborhood. What happened to you? I sat beside him, once I knew we were in the clear. He would need a shower, or at least a sponge bath. There was dried blood all over him, coming from the bite marks I had seen earlier. What sort of animal would leave such large marks? I shuddered to think. I got in a fight, he whispered. With a semi? He managed a faint smile. It sort of felt that way, now that you mention it. I brushed dark hair back from his forehead and felt for a temperature. He wasn't overly warm. I picked up his wrist and felt for a pulse, then timed it with my wristwatch. It was steady, strong. Stronger than I would have suspected, considering the way I'd found him. Maybe he was already healing. He said they healed fast. He turned his head to look at me. Thank you for this. It means a lot. I didn't know how I was gonna get out of that mess. Yeah. Mess is a good word for it. I stood. Can you make it upstairs? It would be best to wash up, get the dirt out of your wounds. The last thing you need right now is an infection. I wouldn't worry about that, he murmured. We don't get sick the same way you do. It was unnerving, hearing him say things like that. From where I stood, he was a man. I couldn't help thinking of him as just a man. Still, I don't feel like getting dirt and blood all over my house. That's fair. He held out an arm, and I pulled a little to help him to his feet. He swayed unsteady. The image of him falling on me and pinning me to the floor flashed in front of my eyes. I wouldn't be able to get up if he did that, he was way too heavy. But he managed to stay on his feet, thank God. We took our time going up the stairs, one step after another, pausing to let him catch his breath. It seemed like he was weakened more than anything else. Already his back seemed less bruised than it did at first. Maybe I was imagining things. I showed him to the bathroom, and left towels on the edge of the sink. Will you be okay in there, alone? I ax. If I need help, you'll be the first to know. He looked me up and down, like he was seeing me for the first time. Unless you want to get in with me. Just in case. I couldn't believe it. He was not coming on to me, in the state he was in. No way. I think you'll be all right. Just call if you need me. I went out into the hallway and closed the door, shaking my head even as color rose in my cheeks. The thought of being in the shower with a man like him. No. Not a man. A shifter. Totally different thing. Plus he was injured. I had to think of him as a patient, no matter how ridiculously handsome he was or how defined his shoulders, chest and abs. I could only imagine what the rest of him looked like, and told myself that was for the best, that I just imagine it. I went to the spare bedroom and turned on the lights, then turned down the bed. The linen closet in the hall was stocked up with supplies, alcohol, gauze, tape, rubber gloves, even a needle and thread in case I needed to suture. I pulled it all out, along with fresh towels and stacked everything on the bedside table. The water ran in the shower, and I didn't hear any cries of pain so I guessed he was getting along all right in there. I went to my room and changed out of my scrubs into clean clothes. There was dirt smeared across my forehead and down one cheek. He must have been pretty hard up to flirt with me like that, looking the way I did. The water stopped, and I went to the closed bathroom door. You okay? Yeah. Exhausted but okay. I'm right out here waiting for you. Moments later, the door opened. At least he'd slung a towel around his waist. I let him lean on me as we went to the spare room, and I helped him lie down on the bed on top of towels I'd spread out in case he started bleeding again. 
So who did this to you? I had to ask again. An animal? Three animals. He grimaced as I ran an alcohol wipe over the largest bite on his left shoulder. Sorry for the sting, I whispered as I put a gauze pad over it, then taped it down. It's nothing worse than what I already went through tonight. At least you don't need stitches. That's a good thing. I bit my lip before adding, Are you sure you shouldn't get a rabies shot or something? His chuckle surprised me. I thought he might get offended. They weren't wild animals, he explained. Oh. I blushed for the second time that night. I don't know how these things work. It's okay. See, my clan is sort of fighting with another clan. I ran into a few of them tonight. I think they wanted to send a message. I'm sorry. I stopped what I was doing and looked him in the eye. Did they leave you like that on purpose? In the road, I mean. Honestly. I don't have a clue. Maybe. Maybe they didn't have the balls to kill me on their own, so they hoped somebody else would. He winced and gritted his teeth as I pressed on his ribs. I think they're broken, I murmured. I know they are, he countered. But it's okay. They won't be by morning. You mean that? You healed that quickly? He nodded. Oh sure. It hurts like hell now but I'll be okay soon. That's amazing. I had no idea. I looked down at his lower half, concealed by the towel. How's everything, you know, down there? At least he tried to hold back a smile. Maybe you should check it out for yourself. I scowled. Come on. Seriously. Seriously? I think it's fine. I don't feel any pain, and I didn't see any wounds in the shower. Good enough. I stood and turned my back to hide the smile I couldn't keep off my face. Just my luck, almost getting run over by a nurse, he murmured, as I gathered my supplies to put back in the closet. You're very lucky in general. Another second, and I would have run right over you. I looked back at him, looking up at me. Good thing I have new brakes. Good thing. He moved and then groaned. Damn. Hurts like hell. Would a painkiller do anything? I went out to the hall. I have some here. I think it'll be okay. I've dealt with pain before. His eyes narrowed a little when I came back in. Do you mind if I stay the night? I shrugged. I had sort of assumed you would. And you were okay with that? Sure. Why not? I sat on the edge of the bed. I'm a stranger and you clearly have no experience with shifters. Right? You're right, I said, rolling my eyes. I didn't know it was so obvious. Anyway, I would call somebody to pick me up, but it's tricky. If there's anybody watching the house, I mean somebody from the other clan, I don't want them to follow and find me here. Just like I didn't want anybody to see you dropping me off. Why not? It might get you in trouble. And you don't deserve that, after doing what you did for me. His eyes met mine, and he held my gaze a little longer than he needed to. My heart skipped a beat. It's all right. It's sort of what I do, you know? Just the same. I would hate to know I got you in trouble, because of it. You don't need to get pulled into this. A scowl crossed his handsome face. What's happening? You said you're fighting with another clan? He nodded. Like a gang war. Think of it like that. I've seen gang wars on the news. You mean to tell me you're killing each other, and stuff? It was bad enough when humans did things like that. Shifters, on the other hand? And outsiders always manage to get pulled in somehow. Innocent bystanders caught in the crossfire. I realized just then that I was one of those bystanders, pulled in before I knew what was happening. Sort of. It hasn't come to that yet, not like full-on war. But it's coming. You don't need to be any part of it. It's best that I rest here and go back tomorrow. It should be safer then. Whatever you think is best. I pulled a blanket over him, waist-high, and put another pillow behind his head. A patient. 
that was all he was. Just a patient, I reminded myself. And when he was gone, I would move on with my life. It was just a strange little detour, that was all. I would still do my laundry in the morning, and catch up on my shows and read and maybe even nap. And he would be gone. That was a good thing. Only when I looked at him, it was difficult to imagine going on like he was never there. Maybe it was the way he smiled at me, or his deep soulful eyes. Maybe it was the feeling that he had communicated with me when he was in his wolf shape. A wolf. He's a damn wolf. Don't forget that. No, I couldn't forget it. He wasn't human, no matter how much he looked like one. What's your name? I ax. It was a safe enough question. Tucker? How about you? Rachel? It's nice to meet you, Nurse Loomis. There was a faint twinkle in his eye. Even half dead, he could charm me. Same here. I'm sorry for flipping out like I did, back at the car. I didn't expect. I trailed off, flustered. Who could expect that? Don't worry about it. Who are you fighting with? The clan, I mean. In case I hear their name. I doubt that you would. It's Eastwing. Eastwing, I whispered. Never heard of it. But I'll remember in case I do. His smile was weaker, I noticed. I'm really tired. Exhausted. Of course you are. You've been through a lot. Close your eyes and get some sleep. I'll be here to keep an eye on you. I watched as his eyes slid shut and within seconds his breathing was slow, even. I camped out on the floor that night just in case. When I opened my eyes, thin faint light was coming in through the windows. I sat up and looked at my watch. Almost six o'clock. He was still in bed, just the way I had left him. I touched my fingers to the inside of his wrist to take his pulse. It felt strong, even stronger than it had the night before. I needed to check his temperature. And it's funny how all those years of training sometimes go away when you're taking care of someone in your own home. Instinct, perhaps? I bent down and touched my lips lightly to his forehead. He felt cool. When I straightened up, I gasped to see his eyes were open. Good morning, he murmured with a sleepy smile. That was a nice way to wake up. I was checking you for a fever, I said. What's the diagnosis, he asked, still smiling. You feel good. Yeah, I do. He winked, and I realized he was in pretty good shape. Just the way he'd said he would be by morning. When I pulled back the blanket, his bruises were no more. All I saw was clean tan skin. Unreal, I whispered. It's like nothing ever happened. I pulled off the gauze patches. No wounds either. Like I said, we heal fast. But I wouldn't have made it last night, out in the road like that. He took my hand. I mean it. You saved my life. It's okay, I said. I'm glad I could help. We stayed that way for a while, me standing over him with my hand in his, eyes locked. I couldn't breathe until he let go. I should call the house to have someone pick me up. He sat up in bed. Of course, my cell is somewhere in the woods. I'll get mine. Give me a sec. I went to my room, where I dropped my purse before changing my clothes. As I passed the windows looking out on the street in front of the house, I noticed a black SUV I had never seen before parked out there. And the man sitting behind the wheel was staring up at my house. Tucker? I hated the sound of the fear in my voice. What's up? I turned away from the window. There's somebody parked outside, looking at me. The next thing I knew, he was tearing down the hall with a sheet around his waist, barely covering him. I didn't care just then. The memory of what he told me about a war rang in my head like a gong. Where? He came to the window. I turned to show him, only the car was gone. It was right there in that empty space across the street. A black car. SUV. What did the driver look like? Was anyone with him? How many? I shook my head. The window was only partly rolled down. It was a man, 
but he wore sunglasses and a ball cap. I couldn't make out anything else about him. Shit. He looked down at me. I gotta get out of here. I'm sure he was only interested in me. You don't have to worry about a thing. Easier said than done for both of us. Chapter 4 Tucker I hope you realize now why it's important not to go out alone. Vincent's eyes burned into me as I sat across from him. I forced myself to hold his gaze. He wouldn't intimidate me into looking away. I wouldn't let him. I've learned my lesson, I said. I wish I believed you, but there's still far too much resentment in your voice for me to be sure. I swallowed back the anger rising in my throat, threatening to spill out of my mouth. I'm being sincere. I've learned my lesson. There are too many dangers out there. I only wish you could have learned it without something like this happening first. Well, that's often how lessons are learned, isn't it? I mean, for me at least. I almost never learned the easy way. I tried to sound lighthearted, but he was having none of it. Next time you pull a stunt like this, I'll send you back to Chicago. I mean that. There's no room in this clan for members who don't take their safety into consideration. Jace cleared his throat in time to cut me off. Good thing, because I was about to use a few choice words his father wouldn't like too much. I think you're a little too hard on him. Oh, you do? Vincent turned to look at his son, standing to his right. What do you suggest I do instead? Talk about a loaded question. He wasn't asking for Jace's advice, not really. He was challenging him. Would he dare speak up against his father's judgment? For one thing, he wasn't trying to pull a stunt. He was going out to have some fun, and haven't we all at one point or another? It was completely innocent. Vincent snorted. That's rich coming from you. My memory isn't as short as you seem to think it is. Before you met your mate, you were out every night of the week. You're right I was. So I know how it feels when you've got to get out and have some fun or else explode, he replied. Jace's words came so fast and smooth, it was like he had already prepared an argument in my favor long before his father called me into his study. He continued, think about it this way. Do you want a bunch of young, hot-blooded clan members stalking around, just waiting for the chance to explode on somebody? Wouldn't you rather they work their energy out in a healthier way? Vincent raised a brow. If I let you do things your way, you'd open a goddamn brothel in the basement. Jace cocked one eyebrow. Now that you mention it, that might not be such a bad idea. Vincent smirked. So you're saying I should let my members, who I'm ultimately responsible for, run around whenever and wherever they want? No, I'm saying you might want to loosen up a little. Remind them to go out in pairs, threes, fours. Strength in numbers. None of this sneaking around alone stuff. Jace looked at me, and he was serious for the first time since he'd come in. That's important. You didn't get in trouble because you went out. It happened because you were alone. I tried to relax and contain my anger. You're right. I shouldn't go out on my own. Point taken. You're handling this all very well, Vincent murmured. Do I dare hope this was truly enough to get you to change your ways and cooperate a little better? Again, Jay saved me. He cooperates just fine. We can't expect him to always be on your heels the way Damien is. Oh, so that was how he felt about my brother kissing his father's ass the way he did. I'd been wondering about that. It was only natural for Jace to resent it a little bit. After all, Jace was second in command, not Damien. But it seemed like Vincent could hardly take a shit without Damien offering to wipe for him. Damien is devoted to the safety and success of the clan, Vincent said, and his voice was sharp. So that was the end of that discussion. Jace's eyes cut to mine, and the look in them told me to let it go. Neither of us would be able to talk him out of thinking Damien was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Me, personally, I didn't get what the big deal about sliced bread was in the first place. Why not let me cut off as thick a slice as I want? 
Vincent waved a hand. Go up and get dressed. Give some thought to what I've said. Don't let this happen again. I won't. You can be sure I won't. I didn't remember the specifics of the fight, but I remembered being sure I'd get run over in the road. It was like all the strength had left my body. I must have put up a struggle, which was something at least. But it left me without the strength to pull myself off the road. I'd seen the headlights coming for me, and hadn't been able to get out of the way. Maybe that was how they planned it, leave me there, knowing I would die. Only I hadn't. And if they thought they were going to get away with it, they had another think coming. I didn't know how, but I would find them. Jace caught up to me as I was climbing the stairs. He'd brought a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt with him when he picked me up, so at least I wasn't walking around wrapped in a sheet anymore. But I needed a shower and a change anyway. I wanted to feel like myself again. Hey, he said, jogging up the stairs next to me. Did you get a look at them? I shook my head. Not really. Nothing that would distinguish them from anybody else. I've been racking my brain all day over it. What did they shift into? Two panthers and a leopard. No shit. You must have held your own to still be here right now. I guess I did. Or they let me live so you'd know what they did to me. I'm not sure. I turned to him when I reached my room. Hey. Thanks for sticking up for me down there. I appreciate it. Listen. I remember what it was like when he was always on my case to get serious, find a mate, get ready to take over the clan, whatever. He rolled his eyes. I'm on your side. I know how it feels, even though I know how important it is for you to keep yourself alive. At least somebody's on my side. I could hardly wait to hash things out with Damien. Jace clapped me on the back, then went on with whatever he was doing. I wondered how his mate was taking the fact that he had practically moved into the mansion once things started heating up between us and the East Wings. What did she think, home alone all the time? Was she worried about him? Did she wish she had never gotten mixed up with us? And why did I care? I got in the shower and checked myself out in the full-length mirror when I was finished. Not a scratch on me, not a bruise in sight. I told Rachel I healed fast, didn't I? But I hadn't had the heart to tell her not to bother bandaging me up. It made her feel better, plus it gave her something to do. I had sensed her nervousness the entire time we were together. She never quite got used to me. I was only half-dressed when Damien knocked on the door, and I braced myself for what was coming as I zipped my jeans. Yeah. He came in and closed the door behind him. How was your night with the human girl? Not what I expected. What? The human girl. The one whose house you stayed at last night. He sank into the easy chair by the window, one of his legs flung over the arm. What are you saying? You knew I was there. Yeah, I knew. The car. The guy with the ball cap. You were out there this morning, weren't you? Uh-huh. I don't know if I'm glad or if I should wring your neck, I growled. What the hell is wrong with you? I needed you. Needed me? He smirked. I think you were doing okay on your own, unless you have problems you don't want to tell me about. He waggled his brows. Demon. I could have been killed last night. Yeah, so what? I called him Demon. He deserved some ribbing, at the very least. He frowned at my use of his nickname, and then his expression changed. What? I was only there because three East Wings attacked me, and the girl found me on the road. Didn't you notice my car wasn't there? Didn't you hear anything about Jace having to go pick me up this morning? You could have been the one to pick me up, you asshole. I strode up to him and hauled him out of the chair by his shirt collar. What's wrong with you? Why would you leave me there like that? Hold on. Let me go. He jerked himself out of my grip and his shirt tore. I drove around for a while, visiting the rest of the clan, checking on stuff for Vincent. I only just got back. How did you find me? 
Stupid question. We had always been able to hone in on each other, ever since we were kids. I would never forget the time Damien got lost out in a blizzard, and I helped Dad and few of the other older guys find him in the whiteout. I could just feel where he was, I told them. That had never changed. I didn't know you were there, for the reason you were there. I just knew you were inside. And you sat out there, watching. Like a stalker. You scared the hell out of that girl, and I thought it was one of the East Wings. Thank God for that, too. I was worried about her. I didn't want anybody going after her because of me. I didn't mean to be creepy. When she saw me, I left. Yeah, I know. I ran a hand through my hair and told myself to calm down. Things could have been a lot worse. Are you okay? I'm fine. I wasn't so fine last night, though. I held up a hand to silence him since he opened his mouth to speak, and I could tell from the expression on his face that he was about to say he'd told me so. I know I shouldn't go out on my own, and I won't anymore. Okay. Even if I'm alone for any reason, I'll be more careful. I shouldn't have let myself get led into that situation. You're right. You have to be more careful. I know, I know. I already went through all of this with Vincent. I shook my head with a sigh. You know what I would love? I'd love it if I felt just once like you were on my side. I'm always on your side. That's bullshit. Jace is more on my side than you are. You're too busy with your nose halfway up Vincent's ass to notice that I might need a little backup. What I don't need is you telling me what to do, warning me, all that. You're not my father. Stop acting like you are. Fine. His shoulders slumped a little. I'll stop caring. I don't mean you should stop caring. Just the same, it'll be easier if I do. Easier on both of us, since caring about your welfare is a full-time job. He pushed past me and left the room, slamming the door when he did. Good thing those doors were so strong, or else we would have already broken them. Chapter 5 Rachel It was a good thing Tucker was out of my life. I told myself so again and again all day long. His cousin had brought him some clothes and taken him home, and that was a good thing. I didn't need the strange, confusing drama he brought to my life. It had been a detour, a diversion. Nothing more. I was back on the straight and narrow again, as I folded laundry while watching TV. Only nothing seemed as interesting anymore. I was already miserable on my way home from work, knowing there had to be more to life than spending my days off doing chores. Tucker was like the spotlight that made my loneliness even more obvious. I was only 26 years old, but I lived like a retiree. Early to bed, early to rise, keep up with the dishes and laundry. Watch a movie with a container of ice cream, or a glass of wine, or both, and call it an exciting evening. What a boring life I led. It was one thing to do well on my own, but another to live like a hermit. Time would pass, and I would forget all about him. It was a comforting thought, and one I held on to as I wrapped up the day. I read in bed that night just like I always did, and turned out the light around 10 o'clock just like I always did. I barely felt it when he slipped into bed beside me. One moment, I was alone. The next he was beside me, heat pouring off his naked body. I barely had time to register his presence before his hand slid under my nightshirt. My eyes flew open in shock. What's happening? I whispered. Then I moaned softly when I saw that it was him. His eyes smoldering in the darkness. His breath was hot on my skin, his mouth hovering over mine. He licked my lips, and I opened my mouth to let my tongue dart out and touch his. Pleasure shot through me, making me shudder. Um, Tucker. I whispered. He didn't say a word, instead choosing to lift my shirt up and over my breasts. The feeling of his mouth closing over one nipple was almost too good. I whimpered when his hand found the other, pinching and flicking. Then his hand slid down my stomach, cupping my mound. I cried out, desperate to feel him against my skin. His breaths came harder, faster, 
like the breathing of a wild animal as he rubbed me. My hips rose and fell, my own breathing out of control. It was all so sudden, and the fact that he didn't say a word somehow made it even sexier. He grunted, and in one violent motion my panties were nothing but shreds of fabric. I cried out when he roughly slid two fingers into my wet, aching heat, pumping in and out, until my muscles started clenching down around him and a wave of bliss threatened to break and wash over me. I was so close. He stopped before I could come, kneeling beside me, picking me up and flipping me over like I weighed nothing. He spread my legs and slammed his thick cock into me before I knew what was happening. I screamed in shock, surprise, and soul-crushing pleasure when he filled me so completely. Yes. Yes, Tucker. I screamed and clawed at the sheets as he pumped into me, harder and harder with each stroke, taking me without saying a word. His hands, or were they claws, raked over my back then moved around to cut my breasts. I whimpered, helpless, unable to control him or what he was doing to my body. All I knew was I had never felt pleasure like it before. I didn't even know it was possible. He grunted in time with our bodies slamming together, using me like the animal he was. I closed my eyes and sank further and further into total bliss, shocked on some level at how strongly I responded to being used that way. Loving it. Wanting more, all he could give me. Take me, fuck me, please, Tucker. Words poured out of my mouth, and he growled behind me, panting, grunting louder and louder, moving in a blur, slamming home again and again, until I couldn't take it anymore. His claws raked over my back but it was good, so good, I didn't care if he marked me. I wanted him to. I wanted to be his, all his, nobody else's. I clenched around his length and screamed into my pillow, only dimly aware of his howl as he exploded along with me. The animal in my bed. I opened my eyes, fists gripping the sheets on either side of me, blankets tangled around my legs. I was sweating, gasping for air, my core pulsing as an orgasm receded. And I was alone. I looked around for a second, before realizing I had always been alone. It was all a dream. The most erotic dream I'd ever had. I had never come in my sleep before. Even during the sexiest, hottest dreams, I would get close but never quite reach the peak. Tucker? I whispered, my eyes sliding shut as I tried to hold onto the images in my head. So? What did you do on your day off? Suzanne leaned over the counter while I was sitting behind the computer, updating charts. Oh, you know. The usual. Nothing out of the ordinary. Except I picked up a wounded shifter on the way home, and oh yeah, now I'm having dreams where he sneaks into bed with me and screws me senseless. No biggie. I glanced up at her, wondering if she could be trusted. Have you ever known any shifters? What? She frowned. Where did that come from? Oh, I don't know. I was driving home on Friday, and I saw what I thought had to be one on the side of the road. A great big dog. Maybe a wolf. But bigger even than that. Abnormal, know what I mean? I propped my chin up on my hand, eyes wide and innocent. I realized that I don't think I've ever known any personally. I mean, it's not like I ask whether or not somebody's a shifter when I first meet them, but you know what I'm saying. Hum. She twirled a stray strand of hair around one finger as she thought it over. I mean, you know me. I go out a lot. That's an understatement, I thought. The girl went through boyfriends like I went through Brita filters. I know I've, uh, been with at least one. Really? My eyebrows shot up. And? And what? Her smile was coy. She knew what I was asking, but wanted me to say it. And how was he? I asked, rolling my eyes. She looked back and forth before dropping her voice to a whisper. Beyond the best sex ever. I mean, off the charts good. Really? I giggled, while warmth spread between my thighs at the memory of my dream. So I wasn't totally off base when I imagined him being incredible. I wonder if it was just him or like shifters in general. Are you talking about shifters? Maggie, another nurse on the floor, sat on the edge of the desk. I've known my fair share. You're a groupie and you know it, Suzanne smirked. 
I'm not. Please. You practically make a notch in your headboard every time you land one. You're totally obsessed. Suzanne chuckled as she walked down the hall. I'm not a groupie, Maggie murmured when we were alone. But I do prefer shifters to regular guys. I'm allowed to have my preferences, aren't I? Everybody has them. Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. So why do you prefer them? Oh God. Where do I begin? They're strong and fierce and protective, and they're absolutely insane in bed. Like beyond good. Every time I've ever tried to go back to human guys, I've always regretted it. They're just not the same. What are you talking about? We both looked up to find Pierce, one of the orderlies, looking at us with a smile. He was cute for sure, and he always managed to find a way to strike up a conversation with me whenever we passed in the hall. Shifters, Maggie said even though I wished she would keep her mouth shut. I didn't exactly want it getting around that I was suddenly interested in them. Not that I was ashamed, but the fewer people who found out why I was interested, the better. I remembered the way Tucker talked about a war. I didn't want any part of it. Oh them. Pierce smirked. What, human guys aren't enough for you anymore, Rach? I blushed. That's none of your business, thanks. I'm just saying, if other guys have been letting you down lately, you should give me a chance. I could change your mind. He winked, then continued on his way down the hall. Maggie watched more closely than I did. I have to say, he's got a hell of an ass. I hadn't noticed. I went back to my charts, even as a furious blush colored my cheeks. I knew he had a thing for me. Everybody knew. He wasn't shy about it. I wish the idea of a workplace romance didn't skeeve me the way it did. I had seen too many of those go badly to think I would be a miraculous exception. Besides, there was somebody else on my mind just then. I wished he wasn't. I wished I could go back to the way life used to be. How had it been less than two days since we met? It felt like a lifetime, maybe because he consumed my imagination. I had never known anybody like Tucker, and all I could do was wonder what his life was like, where he went, what he did. If he was happy as he was. Waste of time. I shook my head, and dug my nails into my palms in an effort to bring myself back to the present moment. I had lives in my hands, and couldn't afford to let my thoughts keep wandering off. It wouldn't be so easy to get off topic, however. So how come you're so interested in shifters all of a sudden? I looked up from my seat to find Pierce smiling down at me. Why is anybody interested in anything? I don't even remember what brought them to mind. I was only making conversation with the girls. I leaned my chin on my palm. Why are you so interested? Why do you think? He leaned down a little, with his thick forearms crossed on the shelf between us. Those arms made him one of the most sought-after orderlies on the floor. No matter how obstinate a patient was, or how heavy, he could get them out of their bed and into a chair or vice versa. His smile widened and became a little more sincere. I've been trying to get to know you for ages, and you keep shutting me down. I'm starting to wonder if I should take it personally. I tried and failed to keep a straight face. If I met you outside the hospital, it would be different. Workplace relationships never work out and always make life complicated. You know that. I also know there's an exception to every rule, he murmured with a sexy wink. I couldn't help the way the fine hairs on the back of my neck stood up thanks to his suggestive tone. And he was a hunk. Something I'd tried to ignore ever since he started showing interest. I didn't want to make things harder on myself when I had to turn him down. His dark almost black hair set off a pair of icy blue eyes. His sharp chin and square jaw, not to mention the bright white smile above them, generally calmed the most ornery female patients, even the ancient ones. For the first time, it seemed silly to turn him down. My excuses fell flat. He wasn't about to let it go, either. If I muttered some half-hearted excuse, he'd come up with a way to get around it. Okay. His thick eyebrows shot up. Are you serious? Sure. 
Why not? You finally wore me down. I knew I would, eventually. Chapter 6 Tucker I should have been paying attention to what Vincent was saying. I knew I should have been. My brother was, of course, the little shit. Brown nosing all over the place. Then, I heard my name and decided to at least pretend to be part of things. Our foot soldiers are getting all the intel they can on the attack. I felt eyes on the back of my head as attention turned to me. Vincent looked stern. We've got to let them know they cannot attack us with impunity. Damien's eyes practically shone as he looked up at his hero. I wondered when he decided to stop looking at our father that way, and how Dad would feel about that. Not like I had to wonder. He'd be pretty hurt, and that would come out as anger. There were a couple questions from other clan members, and I wasn't exactly proud of how easy it was for the East Wings to lure me away from the club, but I told the truth. Vincent pulled me aside after the meeting ended, and the other guys started to disperse. His forehead was creased in a frown, but he looked that way pretty much all the time. I waited for him to chew me out for something or other. He surprised me. Way to step up back there. I blinked. Excuse me. You were honest, and that might make the difference between life and death for another member of the clan. I'm sure it couldn't have been easy to admit how they lured you. I ran a hand through my hair and looked at the floor. No, I didn't enjoy that. You did the right thing for the clan, and I appreciate that. I won't forget it. He patted me on the back before leaving the room. Damned if I didn't feel a little warmth in my chest. All my life, I had prided myself on not caring either way whether Dad or anybody else approved of me. One little compliment from Vincent, and I was almost as bad as Damien. Thinking about him made me look around. He was still sitting where he sat for the meeting. Staring at me. Glaring more like. What's wrong? I stayed where I was though, since I was pretty sure he wanted to maul me. How do you do it? His voice was flat toneless. Do what? He laughed as he stood. You do something stupid and thoughtless and selfish. You almost get yourself killed. You even pull a human girl into it. And what happens? Vincent congratulates you. He didn't congratulate me, jackass. He thanked me for being honest. He knew it wasn't easy to admit how that bitch fooled me. And he actually thinks you did something for the sake of the clan. He rolled his eyes. Will you ever stop being a jealous little punk and act your age? I was still pissed at him for leaving me at Rachel's, even when he didn't know yet that I was all right. Instead of pushing me further like I expected him to, his shoulders slumped. I guess I just wonder what I have to do to get the respect you do. Me. Get respect. I laughed. It was that ridiculous. Yeah. You get respect even though you always fuck up. He took one step toward me, then another with clenched fists. You do whatever the hell you want, and you don't care what anybody thinks, but everybody still likes you. You're dad's favorite. No, I'm not, I spat. Yeah, you are. You're the one who's always kissing his ass and doing stuff for him. He goes to you first with all sorts of shit. He asks for you to handle things for him. The grunt work, he muttered. Stupid shit he doesn't want to do himself. Even then, he's like my shadow all the time. He doesn't trust me to do anything on my own. He's a control freak. Yeah, but that doesn't change that he doesn't give me anything important to do. It's all for show, and all because he knows that's what I want. He'd rather shut me up than actually give me a chance. Was that true? I had never paid close attention to the way Dad treated him. I only reacted to what I saw on the surface. That didn't change the resentment that had built in me over the years. You can come and go as you please at least. How's that feel? I don't get to do that. He snorted. Give me a fucking break. Like that matters. You still do whatever you want, even when he gets on your case about it later. 
You never really get in a lot of trouble. Sometimes I think he respects you for going against everything he wants. You could do that too. Stop acting like this is all my fault. He shook his head. That's not who I am, and you know it. People are born a certain way. I don't have what it takes to do the sort of things you do. I'm no good at not playing by the rules. You could be if you tried. I don't want to try. We looked at each other for a long time, and I felt like I should say something. You're wrong about him respecting me, I finally said. You don't know what it's like to always feel like somebody's against you. You could stop being pig-headed. Like you said, people are born a certain way. He nodded. I guess so. Just do me a favor, huh? What is it? His eyebrows knit together until they were a single line over his eyes. Back the fuck off. Let me do what I want to do. Let me be who I want to be. Keep your opinions away from me and stop making faces and rolling your eyes and shit during meetings. I snorted. Wow. Okay. I'm serious, Trek. He looked it too, and he sounded like a different person. Way more intense than the brother I thought I knew. I have plans, and I don't need you undermining them or making me look like a fool. So stay out of it. The fact he'd slipped back into his childhood nickname for me meant his mind was elsewhere. I waited for him to crack a smile or do something else to break the tension, but he didn't. He only pushed past me on his way out to the hall. I wondered what he meant by his plans. What did he have in mind? And when should I tell our father about it? This is a stupid idea. A really stupid idea. I muttered to myself the entire way to her house. I shouldn't have gone, and I knew I shouldn't have. Every mile that passed between headquarters and Rachel's little house on the other side of town brought even more self-doubt. It not like you're going in, I muttered as I drove. You're not even gonna let her know you're outside. You won't even park. You'll just drive by like a stalker. No big deal. I shook my head at myself, but I kept on driving. I couldn't stay away, no matter how times I told myself I needed to. She was a good, innocent girl, and she didn't deserve getting pulled into my world. I might have died if it wasn't for her. Leaving her alone would be the best way to pay her back for saving me. Still, no matter how wrong I knew it was, I couldn't keep myself away. No matter where I was going, my car kept finding ways to point itself in the direction of her house like I had no control over it. My dreams were filled with her too. Every night, all night long, I dreamed of being with her. Hanging out with her. Sleeping with her. Over and over again. The problem was, my dreams had taken a darker turn. There was less sex and more danger. There was never a clear defined threat, but just an overall feeling of dread. Even when she wasn't present in a dream, she was the focus of it. I was trying to find her, or trying to protect her, or getting revenge on somebody for hurting her. That was the reason I gave in and didn't turn around when I started driving in the direction of her place. I told myself it was okay. I didn't have any other way of getting in touch with her to make sure she was all right. She was my responsibility, in a way. If there was trouble, it was all my fault, and up to me to make things right. It was almost dark by the time I reached her street. It was a quiet little block lined with houses like hers. Lights glowed inside the neighborhood's homes, and I wondered about the people inside. Was it one of them she was in danger from? Maybe a neighbor who took too much interest in her. She wasn't home. I face palmed when I remembered she was working the night shift. She was on her way home from work that night when I was in the road. Might not be a bad thing, I murmured as I put the car in park and climbed out. A quick look around told me nobody was paying attention. I walked up to the front porch and examined the windows to be sure they were solid. I could have opened them pretty easily, but I had enhanced shifter strength. Probably no ordinary human could do this. I then walked around to the side of the house, where the windows were around eye level. Anybody could see inside through the thin curtains if she had the lights on. 
I rolled my eyes. Why didn't she just put a sign out front? Peeping Tom's welcome. The backyard was small, but she did her best to make use of the space. Flower beds, fresh herbs, a few vegetables. It was totally the kind of thing she would do. I made sure to take another look around before trying the doorknob. She could have used something stronger. She could have used a lot of things. I had to do something. I wouldn't be able to sleep if I had to worry about her living in a house that screamed, rob me. I had a bunch of ideas before I even reached the car. Chapter 7 Rachel I what? The lady on the other end of the line cleared her throat and began again. Ma'am, you're scheduled for a full security package. A security package? Who the heck was pranking me? What does that mean? According to my computer, you're getting a security system including window and door sensors, broken glass sensors and two door-mounted cameras. I laughed. She didn't. I didn't purchase anything like that. I think you have the wrong information. Who are you again? Central Florida Security, ma'am. I'd at least heard of them. She kept talking. And this was purchased several days ago. Paid in full. In your name at your address. I tried to figure out who was really calling. It had to be somebody from work or one of my few friends from around town. The voice didn't sound the least bit familiar, though. I guess this must be some kind of gift, I eventually replied. Because I didn't order this. I'd look into this as soon as I got of the phone with her. A generous gift. She let out something that sounded like it was trying to be a laugh. I only need to know when you'll be home to oversee the installation and learn how to use the system. Oh. Ah, uh, any morning. Or I'm off this coming Monday. We agreed to make it that coming Saturday morning, first thing. Great, getting to wake up early after a late shift. It was for a good cause, even if I was still perplexed. Who would do something like that? The woman on the other end of the call promised to email me confirmation of my appointment. At least I'd be able to see if they looked legit based on their return email address. The email came through when I was on my way to the library. I decided to take a trip there to find out what I could about shifters before going to work. I hadn't been able to stop thinking about Tucker and still wanted to know more about his clan and the one they were at war with. I wondered how it all started. Why didn't they like each other? How old were they? Where had they started? Frankly, did anybody know where shifters came from at all? That was a big one for me. I hoped I'd be able to find an old volume or two that would tell me about their history. The library wasn't exactly busy on a Thursday afternoon or any afternoon when I'd stopped in to pick up or return books. I wondered if it was ever busy anymore, thanks to the internet. Kids would never again know how it felt to write reports based on what they found at the library. I nodded to one of the ladies behind the desk and reminded myself that being on a first-name basis with all of the librarians wasn't exactly something to strive for. I was old-fashioned. I liked the look and feel and smell of a real book. They were used to seeing me wandering the stacks. I flipped through the card catalog. How would they be listed? What would the book be named? Unless there was something called shifters, I was lost. Would they be included in local Miami history? I looked under E for Everglade. No luck. It started looking like I was wasting my time. Can I help you find something? Miss Doris smiled up at me, her faded eyes swimming behind thick glasses on a chain around her neck. This is going to sound silly. My cheeks pinkened, I could feel it. She only smiled kindly. You have no idea some of the things people ask me for help finding. I looked around to be sure nobody was listening in, not likely seeing as how we were virtually alone, before leaning in to whisper. I was hoping to find something about shifters. Specifically, the history of local clans. She blinked. Oh. My. That wasn't what I expected. I had to laugh. What did you expect? 
Whenever a young woman like you tells me she's embarrassed or feels silly, she's usually looking for one of those dirty books with the bondage stuff. I bit my tongue almost hard enough to bite it off. On the list of things I never expected to hear, Miss Doris talking about bondage books was right up at the top. So, do you know if the library stocks any books on them? Or books which mention them? She frowned. I can look into it for you, but it might take a little time. They're pretty secretive, the shifters. They keep to themselves. And we didn't have much to do with them, until not very long ago, you know. That's true. I felt like more of a stupid jerk every second. Like I said, I'll take a look through some of the material. Oh, you don't have to do that, I assured her. Don't you worry about it. Sometimes it gets a little too quiet around here. She promised to give me a call if she found anything, and I left for work feeling let down. Between my unexpected security system and the lack of progress at the library, I was in a funk all throughout my shift. Pierce had already asked me to eat dinner with him in the cafeteria, and I told myself to shake it off before we met up. We hadn't been out for an actual date yet, seeing as how we were always working, but we both had off on Monday and were planning to go out for dinner then. Hey beautiful! He nudged me from behind while I was waiting for a fresh order of chicken fingers. I wasn't in the mood for healthy food just then. Hey you! It was nice getting attention from him for once, and I couldn't ignore the jealous looks from the doctors and nurses who saw us together. That was nice too. I haven't seen much of you today. I've been back and forth from the ICU most of the night. He rolled his head back and forth to stretch his thick neck. Plenty of new patients in there today, and everybody needs to go down for tests and x-rays. Ah, I'm sorry. It's nice seeing you on the floor during my shift. He grinned. I'll have to make it a point to stop by then. I tried to smile back, but it was a weak imitation of my normal smile. He noticed right away. What's wrong? You look especially tired. Oh thanks. I rolled my eyes with a chuckle. You know what I mean. What's going on? Rough night? I considered telling him that yes, it had been an especially rough night so far. That would have made it easy to write off my distraction. He wanted us to be a thing though, didn't he? And didn't I? Sure I did. So it was important for me to share things with him. I decided it was safe to share my day with him. We sat across from each other, at a little table. He unwrapped his sandwich and listened as I told him about my security system. I got the email with the confirmation and it all looks legit. They're a real business with lots of positive reviews too. Somebody paid all that money for an in-home security system? Do you know anybody who has that kind of disposable income just lying around? I shook my head. Heck no. Besides, wouldn't they tell me about it if they had set me up? This isn't one of those anonymous angel type things, like when you hear about people paying off strangers' layaway accounts around Christmas time. Or was it? Somebody thinks I need security. I can't imagine who. You think it's some sort of message? Maybe it's just somebody caring about you. I can't imagine who that would be either, I pointed out with a wry smile. My parents are both gone, I don't have a lot of close relatives. No siblings. Hum. Well, maybe it's just one of those times when you're supposed to pay it forward now. Find somebody who needs your help and help them. I couldn't help remembering Tucker when Pierce mentioned somebody needing my help. My eyebrows shot up. Tucker? Was it him? It suddenly all made sense, even though it didn't, since I still couldn't imagine why he'd go to such lengths. But he was the most likely person. He had to be the one that paid for the security system. What's up? Pierce asks. You went away for a second there. I shook my head, just trying to figure this out. Some instinct told me not to mention Tucker, and not just because he was a shifter and probably not eager for humans to know a lot about him. Pierce was trying to date me, 
no sense making him jealous so early in our pseudo-relationship. He reached across the table to take my hand. Anything else? You still look worried. I shrugged. I felt kind of stupid earlier. I went to the library, looking for information. Hang on. You went to the library. He smirked. Who still goes to the library? Yeah, yeah, I'm lost in the past. I waved him off. Anyway, I didn't find what I was looking for and it sort of bummed me out. What were you looking for? A tale spun itself in my head out of nowhere. On the way home on Friday night, I spotted what looked like a shifter on the side of the road. He frowned. What makes you think it was one of them? Because he was shifting into an animal. Oh. Well. There you go. His eyes lit up. Is that why you were talking about them a few days ago? I nodded. Yeah. I guess I'm interested in them, all of a sudden. I'd never seen anything like that before, you know? And it stuck with me. I can't stop thinking about it. So I was hoping to find out a little more about them, especially in this area. What can I expect if I run into one again, etc. I was impressed with how easily I managed to put a story together, one which he seemed to buy. And you thought you'd be able to find something at the library, of all places? Yeah. So? His expression turned serious. See, there's this new invention called the Internet, and it's really helpful when you're looking for information. Okay, okay. I stuck out my tongue. He laughed. Did you think there would be a shifter section in the library? How would I know? I thought I would look, at least. Welcome to the 21st century, Rachel. He stole one of my fries. Try looking online. There's this thing called Google. Shut up. Chapter 8 Rachel Ouch. I sucked the tip of my index finger after burning it on the curling wand, then shook my hand frantically. As if that would ease the burning. This is why I don't do my freaking hair. I checked myself out in the mirror. Even though only half my head was covered in long blonde waves, I still looked much better than I did during a normal work shift. If Pierce thought I was cute then, his eyes would fall out when he saw how I looked when I put in a little effort. He might even be shocked to see that I had a body, instead of a shapeless lump under my scrubs. I'd gone with a sleeveless, light blue dress and a white cardigan. The dress was fun, casual without being too casual, and showed off my legs while wrangling my bust. Most girls would kill to have D-cups, but they didn't know what it felt like to never quite fit into blouses and dresses. I had stopped wearing button-down shirts because they always gaped open over my boobs. I regularly wished for B-cups, or even a respectable C, the boat neck cut of the dress, took care of cleavage overspill. Once my hair was ready, I touched up my makeup and slid into a pair of white sandals. Just in time too, since Pierce knocked at the door only a minute later. Whoa. He stepped back when I opened the door. His eyes took a slow tour of my body, and I felt my cheeks flushing when it became more and more obvious that he liked what he saw. Do I look okay? You didn't say which restaurant you had in mind, so I don't want to look underdressed. His polo shirt and jeans told me I was all right. You look incredible. I had no idea you could clean up so good. Thanks, I smirked. He leaned down to give me a quick kiss, casual but warm, and waited while I locked up. As I did, he looked around the porch. There's your camera, huh? He pointed up at the little device attached to one corner of the doorframe. Yup. That's it. I wouldn't even notice it, it's so small. Amazing, right? He waved a hand in front of it. So you can see me. Check it out. I pulled out my phone, opened the app, and there we were. The feed comes through the app. Isn't that cool? I can set or disarm the alarm through this too. If I get a delivery, I can watch the mailman drop it off and keep an eye on it throughout the day too. We walked down the steps and out to the sidewalk where Pierce's truck was parked. That's definitely cool. I guess you're okay with the whole mystery buyer now? I shook my head. 
No. I'm still not okay with it, and I want to know who did it. I'd thought Tucker would at least reach out and let me know it was him, or even check to see if things turned out all right. I hadn't heard a word. It had to be him. I couldn't imagine a single other person being responsible. Once we were in the car, I made a point of changing the subject. No sense talking about it anymore, especially when it still bothered me a little. So, where are we going? Dinner was okay. I wish I could say more than that, but I'm not sure I was all that into it. No. I know I wasn't. And now we were going back to my place. I looked out the window on the way back to my house, and half listened as he talked about the dodgeball team he was on, and the rock climbing he was doing on his next day off, and all sorts of other things that didn't mean much to me. I wasn't outdoorsy, to put it mildly. Not like I was against outdoorsy people, but I had nothing in common with them. The fact was, I didn't find Pierce very interesting. It was one thing to talk about work while we were at the hospital. That was our common ground, something we could always relate on. Without that, there wasn't much else. Maybe I wasn't being fair. I had to give him a chance. Couples were supposed to have different interests, after all. At heart, he was a nice guy, even if he was a huge flirt, and would probably keep flirting with women throughout the hospital while we were together. I could handle that, because I knew it didn't mean anything. He was sweet and thoughtful, and really listened when I had something to say. He didn't just wait for his chance to start talking, the way other people sometimes did. You okay? His hand touched my bare knee. You seem like you're pretty far away right now. Oh, I'm sorry. He deserved my presence. I guess my mind is wandering. I shouldn't let it do that. It's a habit I have. I do all my thinking while I'm in the car. Me too. His hand tightened. It felt nice. So why did I want to ask him to stop touching me? What are you thinking about? Nothing in particular, I lied. My thoughts are sort of bouncing all over the place. I guess I'm not as interesting as I thought I was, he quipped. You're very interesting. He still didn't move his hand, so I closed mine over it and lifted, though I kept holding on. I didn't want to be totally rude, but I needed to set boundaries too. Not like I was a prude or anything, I just wasn't a fan of being touched before giving permission to touch me. And you're very beautiful. You look gorgeous tonight. Those scrubs don't do you justice. Neither do yours, I said with a wry smile as I looked him up and down. We don't have glamorous jobs, he grinned. No, we don't. Can you imagine if I tried doing my hair like this every day? I touched the soft waves hanging over my shoulders. I'd give it a try once and end up getting puked on or something. Just because. He laughed. Or a patient would spaz out and pull on it. Yeah. You just never know. You're a good nurse. I warmed from the inside out. How would you even know? I know. I see a lot of things, even if I don't let on. All us orderlies do. We know which nurses work the hardest and actually give a damn about the patients. Not all of them do. I nodded. Yeah. I know that. I could think of a few off the top of my head. Women who might have cared once, back when they first went to nursing school. But like longtime teachers or just about anybody who did the same job for years and years, they didn't feel the same sort of passion or connection they used to. You do. You're always going the extra mile. The patients love you. The other nurses love you. We reached my block, and he took his hand back in order to maneuver into a spot in front of the house. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you were buttering me up right now. I gave him a knowing wink after he put the car in park and killed the engine. He unbuckled his belt and turned toward me. Oh, come on. Give me a little more credit than that. Okay. I know you're buttering me up right now. He laughed good-naturedly. Come on. Can you blame me? I haven't been able to keep my eyes off you all night, and I think I've been a very good boy by keeping my hands to myself. 
I glanced down at my knee, then back up at him. You didn't though. Did you? A pretty innocent touch. I smiled in spite of myself. I guess so. Believe me. I've been wanting to do a lot more than that. He came closer. I told myself it wasn't a bad thing. He was hot, sexy, and the way he looked at me made the hair on my arm stand on end. I could just imagine gripping his strong, thick shoulders as he moved in and out of me. I was sure he'd be amazing in bed, too. With a body like that, as athletic as he was, he could probably go all night. Even so, I moved a little closer to the passenger side door. You have more self control than I expected, I said with a shaky laugh. A frown crossed his face. Why are you acting this way? What way? You know what I'm talking about. You keep moving away like you expect me to hurt you. Why? He leaned in even further, and I couldn't put more space between us without opening the door. I laughed again and tried to stay light. I'm sorry. I guess I'm out of practice. You? He reached out to stroke my cheek, and I leaned into the caress. It was nice. He was gentle, but there was the feeling that he was just barely holding himself back. The promise of so much more under the surface was thrilling. What's so strange about that? I whispered, closing my eyes for a second as he skimmed my jawbone, then took my chin in his hand and pulled me a little closer. You're so gorgeous. I can't imagine you not having a hundred guys banging down your door. I shook my head. They don't know where I live. He chuckled just before his mouth met mine. The warmth of him, the skill of his lips as they moved against mine was intoxicating. I willed myself to melt into his kiss, to want his hands to start at my knees and work their way up to my thighs well beneath my dress. I wanted to want him more than I did. But I didn't. Why am I trying so hard? I shouldn't have to try. The thought rang through my head as clear as a bell, as clear as if I'd said it out loud. My eyes flew open, while Pierce's tongue darted out to sweep across my upper lip. It should have made me shiver with delight, it had been so long since a man kissed me that way with passion and promise. Instead, I pulled away. When he strained closer, I pulled back even more. What's wrong? His eyes were hazy with need. He was so sure more was about to happen. I hated to burst his bubble, but... It's me. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I shook my head, telling myself I was acting like a silly virgin. I was hardly a virgin, and I'd had my share of casual hookups in my wild and crazy youth. Only that felt long ago, even though it wasn't and I couldn't bring myself to sleep with him when I wasn't completely into it. Especially since it wasn't like we would never see each other again, so it could be brushed off, forgotten. No chance. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Look what you do to me. He took my hand and started to move it to his crotch. I recoiled in horror. Don't do that. It was like I'd poured a bucket of cold water over his head. That woke up him up, and brought him back to his senses in a flash. Sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I know what you were thinking, and I don't blame you. I held up a hand to silence him. There's nothing wrong with it. And normally, I would be all for it. I don't know why I'm not. Maybe I'm not feeling well or something. I'm so sorry, if you had the idea that we would. No. I shouldn't have had any idea. It's only our first date. He smiled, a disappointed smile for sure. He wasn't pretending to be happy about it. I didn't expect him to. I leaned over to give him a quick kiss. I should go in now. Thank you for dinner. I had a good time. Yeah. Me too. He watched as I climbed out of the car and hurried up the steps. I could feel his eyes on me, and wished he would drive away and forget I existed. I could never explain to him why I felt the way I did, mostly because I didn't understand my feelings. Any other woman I knew would have given an arm, maybe a leg to be with him. He was the stuff of any woman's fantasy. Was there something wrong with me? There had to be. 
and his name was Tucker. Pierce wasn't Tucker. That was the problem. It made no sense for me to want him to be anybody but himself, especially since I had only spent a single night with Tucker and would never see him again. My dreams were pointless but still they came every night. I had slept with him in my dreams every single night. I was falling in love with a phantom, someone totally unreal, someone I would never be with in real life, and that fantasy was getting in the way of reality. I was just about to go upstairs and take a long shower when there was a knock at the door. More like pounding. I thought I made myself clear, I grumbled, storming over to the door with my fists clenched tight. Some guys just couldn't take a hint. I was ready to say some pretty harsh things when I flung the door open. There was a tall, dark, handsome man on the porch. Just not the one I was expecting. Chapter 9 Tucker Leave her alone. Go home. Don't go in there. It didn't matter what I said to myself or how sure I was that I was making a mistake. As soon as she got out of the car and ran up the steps to the porch, I had to follow. I had to know what she was so upset about. Not that I couldn't tell from what I saw through the back window of the car. It didn't take a genius. I was just about to get out and tear the door off the damn vehicle before she got out. This is a mistake, I whispered as I pounded on the door with the side of my fist. I heard her footsteps on the other side and thought there was still time to get away if I moved quickly enough, but I stood in place like my feet were rooted to the porch floor. Like an ass. She flung the door open, and the first thing I noticed was the deep red color on her cheeks. She was seriously pissed. Shock crossed her face when she saw me. Tucker. She froze, blinking rapidly. Her eyes darted back and forth over my shoulder, like she was expecting somebody else. What are you doing here? Who was that? I pointed down the street. The car was long gone by then. What, she spat. Who was that guy? It's none of your business who that was. What are you even doing here? Are you stalking me? She crossed her arms over her chest defensively. Is that what this is all about? Holy shit. Yeah. I was basically stalking her. I had started off trying to be sure she wasn't in danger, but from the outside, it looked like I was the danger she should fear. I just like to check and see if you're all right, is all. Oh, really? Her hands fell to her hips. And when you're making sure I'm all right, do you do incredibly intrusive and strange things like buying me a full security system? Without even telling me about it. So what if I did? Like I said, I want to make sure you're okay here. Her mouth fell open. I do not believe this. You're a flipping psycho. You're the one living in a house with no security. I could have broken in with no problem. Did you try? Her voice was a shriek. Oh my God. This is what I get for trying to help somebody. I should have known you were some kind of sick pervert. Sick pervert. Sitting in front of my house, watching me, examining the place when I'm not around. Buying hundreds of dollars in security stuff without me knowing about it. And by the way, I'm going to pay you back for that. I don't want to be indebted to you. How did it all go so wrong? Not like I thought she would offer to blow me because I bought a pricey security system, but I hadn't expected to be branded a pervert. I told you. Things in my world are messy right now. I wanted to be sure nobody tracked me here, and if they did, that you would be protected. Is that so wrong? So why are you sitting outside? Wouldn't that just make it easier for somebody to find you and link you to me? She had a point. Because I can't stand the thought of you being here without me. That's why. I can't say it any more simply than that. I spread my arms in a sort of hopeless gesture. I felt hopeless too. She had me. She just didn't know it. What are you saying? She sounded suspicious. I could understand why. I'm saying, I haven't stopped thinking about you for a single hour since I left here. 
wondering who you are and how you are and what you like and don't like and whether you're safe and if you're happy. I want to know everything there is to know about you all the time. I stepped inside the house. She backed up to give me room. And if you're happy, I want to be the reason you're happy. Don't you get it? Jesus Christ. What the hell happened to me? I. I don't know what to say. Her eyes were wide, and her chest heaved up and down, faster and faster, the closer I came to her. I closed the door behind me, then locked it. You don't have to say anything. We don't need to talk, do we? She backed up until she was against the wall, palms flat on its surface. I wouldn't crowd her, and I wouldn't force myself on her. Instead, I leaned one hand against the wall by her head. She chewed her bottom lip and panted for air like an animal in a snare. Only it wasn't fear. I could smell the need all over her, the way she wanted me. My voice was a whisper, and I breathed in her ear. Try to tell me you don't want this. Try to make me believe you. I. I don't. She could barely get the words out. Come on. Try. I ran a single finger over the curve of her jaw. She shivered. Tucker, please, she whimpered. I dragged my thumb over her full, luscious mouth. She closed her eyes and leaned her head against the wall. You know this is right. You want it just as much as I do. Don't try to fight it. Stop wasting your time. I couldn't keep playing with her, not when I wanted her even more than I knew she wanted me. I was already thickening, surging to life, and the scent of arousal coming from her body was too much for me to resist. I replaced my thumb with my tongue and gently swiped the tip over her lips before covering her mouth with mine. She groaned as I pressed her to the wall. No pretense of fighting me. In the blink of an eye, she was putty in my hands. I could do whatever I wanted, and she wouldn't fight it. She wanted it too. Under that nice girl exterior, she was an animal just like me. I reached down to run my hands over her legs, and she wrapped one of them around my hip. I ground my thickening length against her, and she groaned into my mouth while I moved up her thigh until my fingertips brushed against the lacy trim of her panties. Her ass was full firm, and she shivered when I dug my fingers into her flesh. I could smell her need. It was like a drug I couldn't get enough of. Her hands clutched at me, clawing and gripping, holding on for dear life while I came dangerously close to the center of her heat. It drew me in, and I touched her swollen lips before dipping inside her wet heat. Oh God, she gasped, breaking our kiss to pant for air. I took the opportunity to devour her neck. I felt her pulse racing under my mouth and sucked on her as I fingered her until she shrieked softly going stiff all over. Her pussy pulsed around my fingers and I kept them there until she relaxed. Come here. I lifted her in my arms and she wrapped her other leg around my waist. I carried her upstairs that way and she shucked off her sweater as I climbed. I unzipped her dress and let it fall off when I put her on her feet next to her bed. She cupped my straining bulge and stroked through my jeans as I sank my teeth into her glorious tits. I could have stayed there all day, licking and nibbling on her until she went hoarse from crying out my name, but the ache in my balls was too much to ignore and didn't get any easier to handle the more she stroked. I pushed her back onto the bed and tore her panties to shreds while she gasped in shock. There was no time to apologize. I was too busy pulling my shirt over my head then working on getting my jeans off. She forgot the shredded panties when she caught sight of my body. It wasn't the first time she'd seen it, but she was finally touching it the way she clearly wanted to. I groaned as her fingers skimmed my chest and abs, then up over my shoulders and down my arms. Perfect, she whispered. I finished unrolling a condom and lowered myself between her thighs. You're perfect, I groaned as I pushed forward. She cried out and clawed at my back on that first thrust. I had no doubt she had never taken anybody as big as me, and she was tight enough to make it tough not to come right away. I gritted my teeth and waited for the urge to pass. When it did, I withdrew and pushed forward again. And again. Her cries built in volume and only made me want to take her harder, more completely. 
I wanted to fill every inch of her. I wanted her to come until she cried. Take my cock, I growled as I fucked her. Take it. I love it, she gasped between grunts of pleasure. Fuck me harder. Please. Her head rolled from side to side as she succumbed to what my thrusts built up in her. I pounded her harder, faster, growling and grunting and letting loose with a series of sharp merciless thrusts that made her clench around me in a death grip. The sound of her ecstatic screams filled my ears as I came along with her, howling at the end. The room was full of the sounds of our pleasure by the time I collapsed next to her with a groan. Whoa, she managed to gasp. That was so much better than my fantasies. Just like that, I wanted her again. I would show her something to fantasize about. Chapter 10 Rachel Can I tell you something without you thinking I'm a complete nutcase? We were in bed, side by side, and there was a soft breeze coming in through the open window. It ruffled the light curtains and made what was left of the perspiration on my skin feel cool. Goosebumps rose all over me, and I clutched the sheet a little closer. He snorted. That's a good let-in. I mean it. I don't want you to think I'm nutty over this. Okay. I promise I won't think you're nutty. He struggled to keep a straight face. Well, at least he was trying. I went to the library last week, trying to research your clan and the other clans. He hooted with laughter. He actually hooted. And I'm the stalker? You had the nerve to call me a stalker? Amusement colored his voice. Hey. I didn't sit outside your house. I gave him a playful shove. Yeah, well, you don't know where I live. He grew serious, and his smile faded. Did you find anything? I shook my head with a scowl. No. It was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I thought so. You thought so? There isn't exactly an entire section out there on us. We like it that way. But if you really were dead set on finding information, you could find it. You would just have to know where to look. And uh, where would that be? I asked with a coy smile. Nope. He folded his massive arms over his equally massive chest. Why not? Because I told you already. I don't want you getting any more involved with my life than you already are. Not because I don't like you, he added quickly, when he saw how offended I looked. But because I don't want you to get in any deeper. It's really that simple. Maybe it is for you, but it isn't for me. I'm sorry to hear that. It doesn't change my feelings on the subject. So that's it, huh? Case closed? I sat up drawing the sheets even tighter around my naked body. That's not fair. You don't get to tell me what to do. It's bad enough you decided I needed added security and took it upon yourself without talking to me about it first or ever. We're back on that? Hell yeah we are. I realize your heart was in the right place, I really do, but it was a little weird that you did all that for me. You do understand, don't you? It's important to me that you're secure. You could have gone about it a different way. I have my own way of doing things. Simple as that. Not so simple, and you're pig-headed. I've been called worse. His deadpan delivery made me laugh, and the tension dissolved. Still, I looked down at the bedspread and traced the pattern with one finger. I was still a little annoyed with him. More than a little, even. I couldn't understand why he didn't understand. He sighed. You're gonna sulk now, right? I don't appreciate you saying things like that. You make me sound like a child. But you're sulking. I glared at him. I'm a grown woman and a nurse. A nurse with a master's degree. I'm not a child who can't be trusted with information. You know? I get it. He rolled onto his side and looked over at me. It really means that much to you, huh? Yeah. It does. Frankly, I didn't even care that much anymore about actually researching. I was more irritated over him telling me I wasn't allowed to know. I can tell you a few things if you want. Would you? 
I slid back down and leaned on my elbow, facing him. Sure. What do you want to know? I don't know enough to know what I want to know. He laughed. He had such a great one, rich, deep, and I felt good just knowing that I could make him laugh like that. Okay. Hum. To start with, we came over from Europe back around the time of the Puritans. Seriously? That long ago? They weren't the only ones seeking freedom from persecution. You were persecuted, then? Humans knew about you. Sure. From what I've been told, we've always tried to be as discreet as possible with how and where we hunt, but these were Puritan times. Not exactly open-minded or understanding of anybody who was different. People who changed shapes became other creatures. It didn't matter how they ended up that way or what they shifted into. They were of the devil, and anything of the devil had to be removed. So a few snuck onto the ships traveling to the New World. Once they settled, a few more came over on and on until there was a village of shifters living in the Appalachians. It was easier that way, we could stay safe there, away from humans and there were plenty of animals to hunt from. It was really the new world for all of them back then. I realize I keep going back and forth between us and them by the way. It's okay. They were your ancestors. It makes sense that you would talk about them that way. He nodded. Anyway things were good for a long time, several decades in fact. Until one of the original shifters, one of the settlers you could say, decided there was no reason to stick to animals when it came time to hunt. See, we don't eat food the way humans do. A good rare steak will do when there's nothing else, but otherwise there's nothing better than a hunt. We don't have to do it every day, but a few times a week is the average. Anyway, this settler from back in the old country remembered how it felt to hunt humans. From what I understand, there's no comparison between animal meat and human meat. I gulped. From what you understand? Oh come on. Do you honestly think I would hunt humans? He rolled his eyes. Give me a break. It's against our treaty with the humans for one thing, but I've never developed a taste for human flesh or blood and I don't see myself developing a taste anytime soon. That's good to hear, I whispered. All of a sudden, I had felt like a buffet item. Just in that moment, I remembered that I was in bed with an animal. Sure he looked like a man on the outside, but he was still an animal inside. That was the start of the great divide in our species. There was a faction, and a very large one, that didn't see the need to ever go back to hunting humans. That was one of the activities that had first gotten us into trouble with the humans back in Europe. People would disappear from small towns, travelers, people passing through, that sort of thing, and eventually, even if shifters didn't have anything to do with it, we were blamed. Many of the old ones remembered what it felt like in those days. They were comfortable the way they were. Some were even prosperous. They were starting new families and moving on with their lives. I nodded, for him to continue. I was completely fascinated. I won't lie. But there was another faction that didn't believe we should live in darkness, hidden in the mountains, trying to avoid notice. They wanted our species to dominate based on our sheer strength. Humans should fear us, or so they thought. They were superior, stronger, special. They should be afraid of us. They should be the ones living in seclusion, avoiding notice. I shook my head. So they started a fight. Worse than that. They started a split. They wreaked havoc in the nearby towns, taking out humans left and right. It was a bloodbath. I shuddered at the thought. Those poor people. They had no idea what they were up against. I tried to imagine creatures like Tucker attacking the townsfolk, coming down out of the mountains at night to hunt. Needless to say, I'm part of the faction that wanted to stay in the mountains. Even so, they couldn't stay there for long. What happened in Europe happened all over again here. Humans started getting word of the creatures in the mountains, shapeshifters, violent beasts. It was clear we had to leave. That was when the great exodus started, and we ended up migrating down to Florida over the years. That's how the Everglade clan got here. They staked a claim, 
and united under a single name as a show of strength. What about the others? They lived up in the mountains for as long as they could, but even they had to leave after a while. Their numbers were thinning out, they might have been stronger than humans, but there were a lot of humans willing to band together to burn down their homes and the surrounding forest. They were no match after a while. Some migrated west while others stayed along the coast. Some came all the way down here, where the Everglades had already set up their lives. They promised they would play by the rules and live the way the Everglades dictated. Let me guess, I said with a smirk. They went back on their word. It didn't even take all that long. The Eastwings decided to still go their own way. My mind spun. So that was how it all began. What a bloody start. Still, their history wasn't entirely unlike that of my ancestors. They came over from Europe to escape persecution too, just before World War II. Does that give you enough to get started on, he asks. I appreciate you sharing a little. You don't understand how good it feels to learn a little something about you. Why do you care so much? I shrugged. I guess I think you're interesting, you know? You're fascinating to me, especially this whole war thing that's going on. You don't need to know anything about that. His voice went flat. I mean it. Stay away from all that stuff. What's the worst that could happen? I ax. I could tell you stories that would curl your hair for good. He stretched out on his back. It doesn't usually go well for humans who get mixed up with the conflict between our clans. And I couldn't live with myself if I knew your involvement with me led you to the same end. The same end? Rachel. I'm talking life or death shit here. I mean it. Stay out of it. And stay away from the East Wings. How would I ever get involved with one of them? I don't know. I just have the feeling that if it's possible, you'll find a way. He chuckled to himself. You think you're so funny, huh? Yeah, I do. Only there's nothing funny about this. Please. Promise me you'll be careful. I snuggled up next to him and my heart seemed to swell a little when he wrapped an arm around me. I think there's only one solution for this issue. What's that? You need to stick close to me, to be sure everything's okay. He stiffened, and not in a good way. When he moved away from me, going so far as to sit up and throw his legs over the side of the bed, I felt sick. I had pushed too far. What's wrong? He shook his head as he pulled his clothes together, and started dressing. Every piece of clothing he put on, the worse I felt. Nothing that can't be fixed if I get the hell out of here. I have to get away. I can't let us get too close. One of us has to be responsible. Tucker, don't be that way. Why are you acting so crazy? You're paranoid. I'm not. And I don't ever want you to find out how unparanoid I am. Believe me. He tucked his tee into the waistband of his jeans and slid on his shoes. Just trust me on this. Please. I had nothing to say to that. He wouldn't listen, anyway. I could only watch him getting ready to leave and feel like the world's biggest fool. How could I have let myself fall for somebody who was so sure he was wrong for me? And why was it so hard to accept that he might be right? He turned to look at me before going and at least I could identify regret in his eyes. I'm sorry about this. It's for the best. He leaned down to kiss my forehead and I closed my eyes. I wanted that kiss to last forever. I wanted to remember it always. The sound of the front door closing was the last sound I heard before I burst into tears. Chapter 11 Tucker I was doing the right thing. I was being the sort of man I needed to be. I was putting her first, no matter how much it hurt her. And me, damn it. She had no idea how much she could get hurt because of me. I wanted her to maintain that innocence. I would give anything to keep her from knowing how deadly a relationship with me could get. Even if it meant tearing out both our hearts. What was it about her? Why did it hurt so bad to let her go? 
She was just a girl, like any other girl. I didn't believe that, but I had to keep telling myself until it became second nature. She was just another girl. Wasn't she? Nah, she sure as hell wasn't. I had done everything I could for her, right down to spending thousands of dollars on a first-rate security package. And I was leaving her just when I wanted to, the least. There was nothing else I could do. It was well after midnight by the time I got to the mansion, and only a handful of lights were burning inside. I wondered if Vincent was in his office, getting a rundown from his large network of spies. They usually checked in with him late at night, after trolling the club and bars, to get information about the East Wings and any plans they were working on. Sure enough, I heard his voice in there, along with Jace's. It was strange to see Jace taking such a big leadership role in the clan. I still thought of him as a kid, the way I sometimes thought of myself as one, even though we would both be beyond retirement age if we were humans. Was Damien in there? If he had his way, he was. I could almost see him sitting there at Vincent's feet, staring adoringly up at him, hanging on his every word. Would he ever figure out that any leader worth following could see through that routine? It was tiresome. He would never get it. Only he wasn't with Vincent. When I opened the door to my room, I found him sitting in a chair by the window. For a split second, I thought I had walked into the wrong bedroom. No, it was my room. What are you doing in here? I murmured as I closed the door behind me and flipped on a light. Waiting for you. What do you think? Why? What did I do wrong this time? He turned from the window where he'd been looking out and fixed me with an icy stare. You know what you did wrong. I'm too damn tired to tear you a new one over it. It's like talking to a brick wall. For once you're making sense. I snorted as I sat on the edge of the bed, taking off my shoes. Instead, I'm going to ask you one question. I paused, then continued with what I was doing. I pulled off my t-shirt, then shucked off my jeans and pulled on a bathrobe. I needed a shower, not because I hated her smell. Far from it. I wanted to hunt. I needed to hunt. I needed to tear something apart with my claws, my teeth. I needed to make something hurt the way I was hurting. And I couldn't do it with the scent of her, a human, on me. What is it? I asked when he didn't continue. Why are you so dead set on getting that girl killed? I whirled around to glare at him. You're so full of shit, Damien. I'm serious though, and you know I'm right. Otherwise, it wouldn't piss you off so much to hear me put it like that. You're gonna get her killed. You don't know what it's like, Dick. Knowing someone like her, having her in your life even for a day. All you care about is the clan. What's good for us, what's bad for us, what will make Vincent happy. What'll advance your plans for your future. You've never been in love. His eyebrows shot up. Oh. So this is love, huh? Was it? I hadn't even thought the words before saying them out loud. Love. I was in love with her. It had to be love, after all. There was no other explanation that made sense. I was a wreck without her. I was willing to take chances. I was even willing to make myself look like a stalker, just to keep an eye on her and make sure she was safe. I guess maybe it is. Not that it matters. I'm leaving her alone for good. Well, that's good news. His frown faded a little. Because, that's exactly what I was about to ask you to do. I would never do it because you asked me to. I know. I was hoping to at least talk sense to you, though. And if that didn't work, I was gonna remind you of the way that one human girl from the East Wing Club got her throat ripped out. I had heard that story, of course. And I had dreamed more than once about Rachel being in her place, left in a swamp after being mauled to death. I would wake up from those dreams in a cold sweat, sure I would throw up. Aren't you glad you don't have to do that? I leaned on the doorframe between the bedroom and the bathroom with my arms crossed. I've saved you some time. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, he sneered. 
Did Vincent put you up to this? He shook his head. Vincent doesn't know about this. Don't make me laugh. You mean you didn't tell him all about this, her? No. Do you really think I would do that to you? I don't agree with everything you do, but you're still my brother. I couldn't help but feel a grudging sense of gratitude toward him for that. I was almost sure he would have gone straight to Vincent and used that little tidbit of information to get closer to the inner circle. Damien wanted to be in that room with Jace. He wanted to be considered just as important as Jace, because he would never be that important back home. We might have been the head of the Midwest branch of the clan, but Vincent sat at the very top of the hierarchy ladder. Well, like I said, it's all over. So you can rest easy. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna take a shower. Just like that, huh? I thought you said it was love. I did. I wish I hadn't. I shrugged. He leaned forward, forearms on his knees. He looked so much like me, sometimes it was like seeing my own reflection. Not right now, though. He was all business, and I almost never wore the sort of expression that was on his face at this moment. Like he thought he was my keeper or something. So it's that easy for you to walk away from her. No matter how good it feels when you're together. I couldn't believe it, but I heard a taunting note in his voice. What the fuck is your problem? I spat. Why are you twisting the knife in my chest right now? You give me this bullshit spiel about how you're my brother and you wouldn't die me out, but then you'll turn around and make a joke out of how I feel. Just because you don't know how it feels to be in love with somebody, don't take that out on me. Okay. He sat back in the chair, hard. Like I had hit him. That's what you think? I blinked. That wasn't what I had expected. Yeah. Of course. You've never been in love. A small sad smile touched his mouth. I didn't know you really thought that. I was almost sure you knew the truth and just didn't want to say anything to me about it. All these years, and I honestly believe that. Believed I didn't want to say anything about what? What are you telling me? I'm telling you you're wrong. I know what it's like to be in love. He paused. With a human. Since when? I sat in the chair across from him, each of us on either side of a small table. He looked at the wall above my head, and his eyes went unfocused as he started to remember. It's been a long time since I let myself think about her, but it's been forty years now. Forty? How the hell did you keep a secret like that from me for forty years? The seventies. What was I doing back then? Going to the clubs, enjoying the party scene. Who wasn't back then? It was a different time, a different attitude. Not everybody's an open book the way you are, he sneered. Besides, you know how Dad felt about mating with humans back in those days. He's come a long way since then. That's true. So he didn't know, either. As far as I know, he still doesn't. Josie was my secret. She was just mine. I had never heard him sound that way or look that way, and I had never known him to keep a secret from Dad. What happened with her? You broke up. He shook his head. No. She died. Just like that. He dropped it in my lap like a bomb. He sounded completely detached, too. I wanted to know what happened, but I was almost afraid to ask. How fresh was it for him? Sure, four decades had passed, but time wasn't the same for us as it was for humans. What happened to her? I murmured. She got sick. Cancer. She was only 27. Holy shit. How did you keep that to yourself? I leaned closer. Dean. You could have told me. I would have been there for you. You. He scoffed. You were too busy chasing around after anything that moved. You were in that phase where you wouldn't come home for days on end, remember? There was that one time when you ended up in New York, and Dad had to send for you. Oh, right. When he put it that way, I wasn't exactly proud of myself. 
I had missed out on something that had obviously torn my twin brother apart. I couldn't been there for him, but he didn't think he could trust me with something so important. The sad part was, back then, I wasn't much of a brother or a son. I wasn't much help to anyone, including my own self. He continued. Besides, I was sort of selfish. I wanted her all to myself. I know that sounds weird, but I didn't want her to be part of our lives. Just my life. I can understand that. I wanted Rachel all to myself, too. After that, I went away. Remember when I went on that tour of Europe? I wanted to mourn her in peace, and I couldn't hide how I felt. I knew you'd pick up on it eventually, no matter how hard I tried to keep it from you. Yeah. I'm not completely oblivious. I hoped. So, you see. Don't tell me I don't know how it feels. I still remember being in love. I couldn't forget it if I tried, and I don't want to, even though it ended the way it did. I wouldn't trade a minute of the time I spent with her, even when she was sick. Did she know about us? About you. He nodded. And she accepted me. She didn't want me to change. She loved me back. I'm so sorry, man. I really wish you had told me about her, but I see why you didn't feel like you could. Thanks. He stopped looking at the wall and looked at me again. Listen. If there's one piece of advice I can give you, besides leaving the girl alone, because this is the worst time you could possibly be with her, it's this. Humans are a lot more delicate than we are. Falling in love with one of them, it's dangerous. They're so fragile. It's so easy to lose one of them. I nodded. But look at Jace and his cousins. They're all made it up with human girls. They're happy too. And Vincent's totally okay with it. I mean, it can't all be bad. I know. I can only tell you what my experience has been. So please. Don't tell again that I don't know how it feels, okay? You're totally right. I didn't know. I won't make that mistake again. The door burst open. Cord was there, and he looked murderous. Come quick. He didn't say why, but he didn't have to. We ran after him, even with me in my bathrobe. He led us to Vincent's office. Jace looked up when we came in and held a finger to his mouth. Vincent was on the phone. So they mentioned him by name. And they described the attack. He glanced at me, and it was enough to make my blood run cold. All right. Thanks, and see if there's anything else you can find out. Then he slammed the phone so hard, I was surprised the thing didn't shatter. You went to see the girl, didn't you? He looked and sounded disgusted. I was surprised he even knew about her, but decided not to ask how he found out. He had his ways. Yes, I did. I went to check on her tonight, to be sure she was okay. Yeah, well, you're not the only one who was checking on her tonight. Or rather, someone was checking on you. You attracted attention, and somebody must have followed you. They knew you were there. They knew when you left. They know who she is now and where she lives. And they plan on using her against you and against us. I almost shifted into my wolf then and there. My emotions ran wild. Only Damien's hand on my shoulder kept me grounded and reminded me to stay in control. Vincent wouldn't react well to me shifting on him like that. They're sure about this? Jace didn't look convinced. Whoever my contact was talking with at the bar earlier was sure of it. They watched him walk in and knew what went on when he was there. He stayed for hours. Vincent glared at me. He didn't even try to be secretive about it. His car was outside the entire time. Do you realize... They could have been lying in wait for you when you came out. Now I do, I muttered. Don't take that tone with me, he warned. I sensed that he was barely holding himself back too. Why he was so pissed was beyond me. I was the one who cared about her. She was mine to protect. Not his. Damien jumped in. What can we do about this? Is there a way we can move her somewhere else for safety's sake? Maybe the old apartments. He looked at Jace. 
Sure, we could do that, Chase agreed. She could stay in my old apartment for now. The East Wings know about those apartments, Vincent said. That would be pointless. Is there anything else? Damien looked around. We have to be able to come up with something. The girl was only trying to help Tucker. It's not her fault he couldn't stay away from her. I appreciated him sticking up for me, but didn't appreciate being talked about like I wasn't even in the room. It was time for me to step in. I'll make it easier. I'll stay there with her. No way. Absolutely not. I won't allow that because it would mean putting yourself in danger, and I can't afford the extra manpower it would take to make sure you had backup at all times. He paced back and forth behind his desk, hands clasped behind his back. We have to stay clear on this. They want to use her as leverage. So they're not going to do anything to hurt her. She's a lure, she's not a conquest. See what I mean? I did, but I didn't like it. He wanted me to leave her alone, after knowing the East Wings knew about her. That wasn't going to happen. And when I glanced at Damien from the corner of my eye, I could tell he knew it wasn't going to. But he kept his mouth shut. Chapter 12 Rachel The first thing I did on Tuesday was find Pierce. I couldn't let things hang between us the way I had left them after our date. He seemed good-natured enough, and I hoped that meant he had gotten over any bruising his ego had gone through. Hey you! Hey yourself! I wanted to be sure we were still on for dinner in the cafeteria tonight. Of course. Why not? Not every guy would want to have anything to do with me after what happened last night. He shrugged. Like I said last night, it's okay. I'm not the kind of guy who thinks a girl owes me something just because I bought dinner for her. That's pretty cliché by now, isn't it? Cliché, yes, but not completely out of fashion, I smirked. True. But honestly, he took my hand and I let him hold it. If I was that kind of guy, would you want to go out with me in the first place? You seem like a pretty good judge of character. I like to think I am, I murmured. And you're buttering me up again. Why can't I give you a compliment without you thinking I'm trying to butter you up? He was chuckling as he turned and walked down the hall with an empty wheelchair intended for one of our patients. I chuckled too. It's for the best, I thought, as I got on the elevator to go up to my floor. I wasn't wrong to put a stop to things in the car, but it would be wrong to keep pushing Pierce away. Tucker had made it clear there was nothing happening between us, no future. It wouldn't be right to keep closing myself off to a great person and a possibly great relationship when Tucker was a wham-bam thank you ma'am type. He had been crystal clear, and after crying myself to sleep, I had woken up with a clear perspective of my own. Tucker didn't want me, and was willing to use some lame excuse about it being for my own good. I didn't want him, either. It was time to move on. By the time I got home that night, it was nearly midnight, and I was tired in every bone of my body. I hadn't exactly gotten a great night's sleep thanks to Tucker, and a crazy shift combined with that left me ready to fall asleep on the road. It was only by the grace of God that I had managed to keep my eyes open. I dragged myself up the front steps and had the door unlocked when I heard the noise behind me. I froze in place, afraid to turn around or even show that I had heard whoever or whatever it was. I didn't move forward, either. If it was an attacker, I didn't want him to push me inside as soon as I opened the front door. Are you going in, or what? I spun in surprise at the sound of Tucker's voice. What are you doing here? Trying to scare me to death? I looked at the street and realized his car wasn't there. How did you get here? I took a cab. That's beside the point. Come on. Inside. Fast. He practically pushed me through the door, and I rushed to disarm the alarm system before it went off and alerted the police. Arm that again, Tucker ordered in a no-nonsense tone. I didn't even bother asking why or trying to argue against him telling me what to do. That was a waste of time, obviously. What's happening? 
I thought we were over, and you were never coming back because I'm in some terrible danger otherwise. Right? Isn't that the story you gave me when you left me in bed last night? His glare was icy and hot at the same time. I didn't know if I should shiver or shrink underneath it. That's why I'm here, and if you could stop being ungrateful for a minute, I would explain that. Ungrateful? Listen. He took me by the shoulders and held me still. Just listen, all right? One of them saw me here, maybe more than one. They want to use you to get to me and the rest of the clan. My heart almost stopped cold. The East Wings? Yeah. We heard about it last night. Now do you understand? Not entirely. He rolled his eyes. I had to be sure you were okay. Even though, they're trying to use me to get to you? Isn't this incredibly dangerous for you, even being here? I understood why he took a cab then. Less chance of being spotted by anybody who knew his car. I couldn't live with myself if I left you alone. I had to be sure you were safe. Don't you get that by now? He still gripped my shoulders, and when he pulled me close I wondered how I ever thought I could use Pierce as a consolation prize. I had to break things off with him. It was the right thing to do, otherwise all I was doing was leading him on. Being against Tucker's strong, rock-hard chest was all I wanted out of life. Nobody compared to him. Thank you for coming, I whispered, and I dared let my arms wind around his waist. Of course. His mouth was warm against the top of my head. I had to. At least I know now that you really wanted me, and were telling the truth about your reason for leaving. I wouldn't lie to you about something like that. That's not who I am. I know that now. I pulled back and looked up into his eyes. They burned into my soul. There was only one thing on either of our minds just then, and it wasn't my safety. Then again the only place I felt really safe, the only place where things made sense was in his arms. When he used his hands to lift mine over my head, I allowed him to. I allowed him to raise my top over my head and drop it to the floor. I sighed in relief when he cupped my breasts in his hands. How did he know I needed his touch so badly? How did he know it was the most incredible feeling of relief I'd ever experienced? How could he be so rough yet so tender? I felt like his animal side, the wolf, was just beneath the surface as he stroked my curves. His breath was more like a pant, his grunts almost growls, and a musk filled the air as his body started to respond, the way my body was waking up to his touch. He squeezed my breasts almost savagely, and I gasped through clenched teeth, a sharp hissing sound that seemed to drive him further. He pulled the straps of the bra down and the cups with them, then bent his head to lavish hot wet kisses all over my sensitive flesh. I wrapped my arms around his neck and melted into him. Yes? I sighed, throwing my head back. He held me in his arms, keeping me from falling, while bending me back and devouring my neck, my shoulders, then back down to my chest. It was like floating. No, flying. The little flicks of his tongue on my skin, the way he sucked and nibbled and bit every once in a while, sending sparks of passion all through me. The way he held me, almost carrying me, effortlessly. Take me upstairs, I gasped and in moments I was off the floor and on my way up the stairs while cradled in his arms. Good thing since my knees were jelly and I couldn't have walked if I tried. He lowered me to the bed and pulled down my pants, then peeled off my panties while I unhooked my bra. He stepped back and took in the full view of me. I stopped short of covering myself with my hands when I saw the effect I was having on him, a strong solid bulge in his jeans not to mention the way he kept licking his lips. Mine, he growled making the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Spread your legs. I did as I was axe, both a little afraid and almost overcome with excitement. He dropped to his knees between my thighs and breathed deep, closing his eyes as he did. So sweet, he grunted breathlessly before diving in. My back arched, and a cry of pleasure escaped me as he licked my most intimate places, flicking my throbbing clit with the tip of his tongue, lapping up my juices with almost ferocious energy like he couldn't get enough. My entire body buzzed, radiating from the almost exquisite pleasure he was giving me. Yes. Oh God. 
I squeezed his head between my thighs as I came, gripping the bedspread in clenched fists, caught between pleasure and near agony before pleasure took over and wiped me out. My muscles relaxed, and I sighed happily as my consciousness returned. I opened my eyes to find him stripping down, and his proud thick erection preceded him as he climbed into bed. He surprised me, I expected him to lower himself between my legs but instead he rolled onto his back. I took time to admire him the way he'd admired me, all muscle and strength, bulging biceps and rock-hard abs just begging for me to touch. Come here. He held out one hand to me, while the other unrolled a condom over his massive cock. See what you can do with this. He lifted me over himself, and positioned his mushroom head at my wet, pulsing entrance. The second I felt the pressure there, I had to have him. I lowered myself and gasped when he broke through, then groaned as I slid down his length. I rocked back and forth over him. He fit so perfectly inside me, filling me completely, making my muscles clench rhythmically like I was in the throes of one continuous orgasm. Like my body was doing everything it could to keep him inside, close, tight. So he could never get away from me. Yeah baby, ride me just like that. He fondled me with his big rough hands, touching me like I was his. Like he owned me, like he knew every inch of me and just what it took to send me over the edge into bliss. He cupped my breasts again, massaging them, pinching the nipples before rolling them between two thick fingers. I was lost, whimpering and moaning and gasping his name as I worked my body over his, looking down to see him watching as I found my pleasure through him. He grunted and started meeting my thrusts with his, and the pleasure doubled. Knowing I drove him to those lengths, that his pleasure was because of me and my body, and what we did together was a power I had never known and never wanted to forget. I could take him, an animal human but not human, something wild and untamed and bring him to his knees, make him shake and grunt and say my name between gasps for air. I could do that. I had that power. It all came together as the tension built in my core with every thrust of his thick hot cock, until I couldn't take any more. Yes. Tucker. I threw my head back with one more long, broken cry, as another orgasm racked me. It was too good, too much for me to handle. I had his arms to sink into when it crashed over me, and I shivered as delicious little aftershocks followed. He was groaning and gasping, and I knew he had come too. We had come together. Something about that felt so right. I held on to him as he held me, and we stayed that way for a long time. Chapter 13 Rachel I wish you didn't have to go. He sighed as he got dressed, his hair still wet from the shower. I know. Believe me. But we have a meeting, and Vincent will have my head if I don't show up. Besides, you have to get ready for work too. Eventually, yes. But not for hours. Funny, but I was starting to worry too. At first I had thought he was crazy to worry about me, but the more he told me I had to lose by being part of his life, the more I wanted somebody looking over my shoulder for me at all times. He must have seen the worry in my face or heard it in my voice, because he wrapped his arms around me. You'll be fine here in the daytime, I'm sure. Besides, that's why I spent all that cash on that alarm system. I laughed softly and he laughed with me. I heard it rumbling in his chest, my ear pressed against it like it was. He smelled so good. I took a deep breath to soak in as much of it as possible. You'll be safe at work too. And I'll come to meet you tonight, if you want. Of course I want you to. I wanted to be with him every night, if possible. Not just because I was afraid to be alone, either. I wanted to spend all the time I possibly could with him. Danger be damned. I'll see you then. He loosened his grip on me just a little, and I stretched up on my tiptoes to brush my lips against his. It felt electric, as always. Even the most innocent kiss between us felt electric. I walked him to the door, and watched as a car pulled up to pick him up. He disappeared inside, and it took off. I looked down at my phone, where he'd finally added himself as a contact. I knew I could call him if I needed anything, and I hoped he would call me if he found out anything I needed to know. I locked the door and armed the alarm, 
then headed upstairs to get dressed. I had to keep myself busy, it was just as good a time as any to clean the house. I put on an old t-shirt and pair of bleach-stained sweats, and was just barely started when my phone rang. I jumped, expecting it to be Tucker. It wasn't. Hello? Rachel? This is Miss Doris. I remembered how she'd offered to get in touch with me, if she found any information. Oh hi Miss Doris. How are you? I carried my hamper down to the laundry room as I talked, the phone between my ear and shoulder. At least, she was a nice distraction. I'm fine thank you. I have a book here, which I think you'll find interesting. It doesn't say too much about the shifters. She whispered that last word, and I bit my lip to keep from giggling. But it does mention the Everglade and Eastwing clans. They're the two biggest clans in Florida, maybe even in the entire Southeast. Right. I've heard those names before. I sorted out the laundry as we chatted, until she said something that caught my attention. Did you know the leader of the Everglade clan used to be an Eastwing? I stopped everything and focused on what she was saying. What's that? That's what I read. It's heavily implied, anyway. Isn't that interesting? All the inter-clan business. I wouldn't know one of them from another, but I do understand they don't get along. Apparently, it all started because of this Everglade leaving his clan for his current clan. I didn't think it started there, but it made sense that Vincent changing clan affiliations had set off a new level of intensity in their rivalry. It made perfect sense. I would have bet anything that Tucker didn't know. None of them could know. How could Vincent earn the faith of his clan otherwise? Thank you so much for sharing that with me, I managed to say over the roaring of blood in my ears. I'll have to stop in and pick up that book. Please do. I'll set it aside for you. If you come in and I'm not here, just let whoever is here know it's waiting. I hung up with her sweet voice, still echoing in my head, but I couldn't bring myself to care about anything other than what she told me. Should I tell Tucker? The question weighed heavy on my mind. If I did, it might make things difficult for the Everglades. They might lose faith in their leader at a critical moment. Or he might already know. That was a possibility. They all might know. It might have been an open secret. I might have been making a big deal out of nothing. I decided to call and leave him a message at the very least. I went up to the living room and fired up my laptop as I waited for voicemail to pick up. Hey, it's me. Everything's okay. I wanted to talk to you about something I just found out. Do me a favor and call me back, okay? Or better yet, come over. But once again, everything's okay. No emergency. I hung up feeling like a loser. What a mixed message I had just given him. Call me back right away, no, come over, but no big deal. I shook my head at myself. So much for house cleaning. I started down a long, dark rabbit hole of research. With the little bit of information Tucker had already given me about shifters coming over from Europe in the 1600s and moving to Appalachia, I started looking around for anything that filled in the gaps. I was so deep in my research that I almost missed the knock on the front door. I realized it was Tucker. Why hadn't he called to tell me he was on his way? I disarmed the alarm and hurried to answer. Once again, the tall dark man on my porch was not who I had expected. Pierce? He held a bouquet in one hand and a bottle of wine in the other. Yeah. It's me. He looked expectant. Um, what's up? It was only eleven in the morning. We were both scheduled to work that night. Did you already forget we made plans for lunch today? A picnic. I searched my memory. A picnic date? Had I forgotten? We could have made it a week earlier for all I knew, but a lot had changed since then. I felt like the world's biggest moron. I'm so sorry. I completely forgot. I looked down at myself. At least I had showered, but I was hardly dressed for company, much less a date. I can run up and be dressed in five minutes. 
take your time. I'm early anyway. He stepped inside and immediately noticed the laptop on the couch. What's up? Looking at porn before work? Ha ha, I smirked and I was just about to slam it shut before he stopped me. No, seriously. What is this? He sat down and pulled the machine onto his lap. I couldn't help thinking, he had a habit of putting his hands where they didn't belong. People with a lot of confidence had a tendency to do that. Just another reason why we would never work. It would be best to cut things off right away. I was already starting to think about letting him down easy before leaving for the picnic. Just get it over with. It would be one thing if he showed up for a friendly picnic, but he'd brought flowers and wine. That wasn't a just friends move. I was doing some research. Remember? I was telling you before that I was interested in shifters. It's not a big deal. Why was I so embarrassed all of a sudden? I didn't care what he thought about me, not really, and it wasn't as if I was doing anything wrong by looking at a few websites. Wow. You're like a dog with a bone when you get an idea in your head, aren't you? I like to refer to it as tenacity, I replied with a smile. I'm gonna go get dressed now. How do you not know? I had just been about to run upstairs when his voice stopped me in my tracks. It had changed somehow. Know what? I turned slowly. He was standing. The laptop was on the coffee table. How do you spend so much time with the shifter, but not know one when he's sitting right across from you? How do you let one in the house without realizing who he is? He took a step toward me. Or maybe you did know who I was, and that was what kept you from sleeping with me. You knew there was something I hadn't told you. What are you saying? This isn't funny, Pierce. It suddenly occurred to me, we had never made a date. He only used that as an excuse to get in the house. I don't mean to be funny. There's nothing funny about this. Then he smiled. Okay. Maybe there's one funny thing. The way everything fell into place without me even meaning for it to. I mean, you made it too easy. I guess that means it was meant to be. My heart raced double time. What was meant to be? None of this makes sense and I don't like it. This is getting weird. I think you should leave. It was like he didn't hear a word of what I said. He took another step toward me, and I slipped away from the stairs and toward the kitchen. I suddenly felt the need to be holding a weapon of some sort, and the only thing I had were knives. Pierce, I mean it. I need you to go now. We can talk about this at work later on, okay? But for now, I have things to do and you're holding me up. Again, I might as well have never spoken. He had his agenda and was going to fulfill it come hell or high water. You did all the hard work for me, he said. His eyes were bright. Too bright. Scary bright. What do you mean? What work? I tried to put space between us, but he advanced on me. There was no way around him either, he was too wide, his arms too long. He was too fast, too strong. He had me trapped. As soon as I tried to dart for the kitchen, he threw himself in front of me and backed me into the wall. You know what work. I see it all over your face. You're not a very good liar, then again, it might be the way I can sort of read people. You know what I mean? Reading people? I guess so. You know so. You know I'm not psychic. You know it's because I can smell the fear on you the uncertainty. Pierce. Pierce the orderly. Pierce, the guy you dated for a little while before you decided the Everglade was a better bet? His laughter chilled me to the bone. Why are you doing this? I whispered. Because this is the way it was meant to turn out. I mean yeah, I spent months trying to get in your pants and you finally accepted. That was great. But imagine my surprise when I looked out my rearview mirror last night and saw Tucker running across the street and straight up to your house. Imagine the coincidence, you know? I mean it's a small world and everything but this is ridiculous. A coincidence? How, how do you know Tucker? His smile widened. 
I was one of his attackers. He held out a hand. Pierce Eastwing. Good to meet you. Chapter 14 Tucker Along with this intel, we have a lot of other information pouring in from various sources. My network is buzzing with rumors and stories alike. No matter whether all of these stories are true, the fact is this. Activity is increasing, which tells me the East Wings are ramping up for something big. This is it. What we've been waiting for. The tension in the room was palpable. I could almost taste it. We were all on edge, ready to attack. We would have gone straight into battle for him just then, all of us. And we would have probably won, too. There was just that much raw energy. Vincent looked out over us, and he looked both grim and satisfied. I could imagine why. He was finally seeing the war he had been preparing for. Just in time, too, since dissension had been spreading through the ranks. He would have had a hard time trying to keep everybody in line for much longer, with no real fight on the horizon. Jace went over the plans they'd put together, breaking us down into groups. I saw how pleased my brother was that he ended up in a group with Jace's cousins, then my name was called in the same group, and some of that smug pleasure dissolved. I couldn't help feeling a little smug myself, that he could get knocked down a peg or two like that. He deserved it sometimes, even if he didn't die me out about Rachel. Vincent had found out regardless, so what did it matter? My phone buzzed, and I told myself to ignore it until the meeting was over. We all had to make a show of paying attention, even though my thoughts were all over the place. I knew it was important to show clan loyalty, and I was loyal to my clan. I was only in Florida, because I believed the fight was worth fighting. However, there was a certain girl with skin like satin who tasted like candy. A girl who happened to need me as much as I needed her. It was totally new, needing somebody the way I did. I wasn't sure yet whether or not I liked it. Who could honestly say they liked being consumed by thoughts of somebody else? What if it was her calling me? No, the odds weren't in favor of that. I had just left her. But what if something happened while I was gone? No. I had to stop jumping and letting my imagination run wild. We were about to face some dark times. I had to be smart. Okay. That's it. Stay close by so you'll be aware if we need you. Vincent stood and went straight to his office, followed by Jace. I was glad nobody was looking, so I could pull out my phone and take a glance at it. Two missed calls. Both from Rachel. Some instinct in me immediately pinged. There was something wrong. There had to be. Damn it, I should have answered the phone during the meeting. Vincent knew what was up with her. I listened to the first of two voicemails. She wanted me to call her, but kept saying it wasn't a big deal. That was so like her. The next wasn't like her at all. When I heard a male voice, every hair on my body stood on end. Your girlfriend needs you, he said. So you'd better come quick. Alone. That was it. Nothing more. I stood stock still, frozen in place, unable to process right off. She needed me. One of them had her, and she needed me. And he wanted me to come alone. Of course he did. Was he alone? Did it even matter, as long as he let her go? I saw my brother talking with a handful of others at one end of the room, by the door. Should I tell him? Could I even keep it from him? He could always read me, just like I could always read him. Damien would know there was something wrong. Then what? Would he tell Vincent? Did I want him to? Did we really want to bring out the big guns so early in the battle? What if a bunch of East Wings were lying in wait for us? I had to make the responsible decision for the sake of the clan. With that in mind, I hurried past my brother while trying to keep my thoughts as neutral as possible. I hoped it would be enough to get past him, he never even noticed I walked by. The energy around the mansion made it easy for me to slip out and go directly for my brother's car. I didn't want to run the risk of driving mine. They knew which car I drove. Meanwhile, 
Damien's would be unnoticed. I hoped. We both had a copy of the other's keys on our rings, so it was nothing for me to get behind the wheel and go. He needs to hope he didn't hurt you, I muttered as I drove. Like she could hear me. Damn it. Fuck everything. I slammed my palm against the wheel and floored the gas. I should have known. I knew when something was wrong with her, didn't I? There was some connection between us that I couldn't explain, but it was there. It told me when she needed me, and had been pinging all throughout the meeting. I kept trying to ignore it. She might be bleeding, dying, and I had ignored her needing me. I would never forgive myself if she didn't make it. That much I knew. I was barely keeping myself in check. I was barely holding on. I was about to lose control. What was I supposed to do if I shifted? No. I couldn't shift. I wanted more than anything to give in to the instincts that were almost stronger than my humanity and let myself go. I held on for her sake. She needed me. I wove in and out of traffic, leaning on the horn, driving as fast as I dared in heavy lunch traffic. It usually took 20 minutes to get to her house from the mansion. I made it in 13, slowing down when I was a block shy, so I didn't raise any eyebrows from the neighbors by skidding to a stop. The house looked quiet. I didn't know what I had expected, fireworks. Something to show that there was something important going on, anyway. Instead, the curtains were drawn, the door was closed. I hurried up to the porch, not running but not walking, and opened the door. I knew it would be unlocked. There she was, in a chair from the kitchen, sitting with her hands clasped in her lap, and her wide, terrified eyes locked on mine. She looked unhurt but smelled terrified. Fear came off her in waves so strong it almost brought me to my knees. Somebody had done that to her. Somebody who would have to pay. Where the fuck are you? I spat, looking around. My voice echoed off the walls. Rachel didn't move. A single tear rolled down her cheek. Then her eyes shifted in the direction of the stairs. So he was up there. Are you okay? I mouthed. She blinked once, deliberately. I took that as a yes. I looked up the stairs and held up one finger. She blinked again. He was alone. Just one of him. Still, he was waiting for me. He could have set up a trap. Why don't you face me, instead of cowering in a corner, waiting for me to come to you? I had the balls to show up here on my own, the way you ax. Why don't you have the balls to face me then? I felt my skin starting to shimmer, like I was on the verge of shifting. I held on with all my might. There could come a time for that, but the time hadn't arrived yet. I managed to stay human, but didn't know how much longer I could make it. Trying to flush me out? Footsteps in the upstairs hall, approaching the stairs. Rachel let out a little squeak. I held a finger to my lips and tried to reassure her with my eyes. It's not hard to flush one of you pussies out, I called. Though I'm surprised you're facing me on your own. Don't you usually have to travel in packs because you're so afraid of the Everglades? Maybe you're the one who needs to travel with a pack. His feet were visible as he descended. I watched as he revealed himself to me piece by piece. By the time he reached the living room, I was sure I didn't recognize him. But he sure seemed to recognize me. You look a lot better than you did a couple of weeks ago, he said. That night in the alley. My skin shimmered again. I was so close to losing control. You were one of them. Yeah, I was. Small world, right? He walked over to Rachel and put a hand on her shoulder. My blood boiled over at the sight of him touching her, the way she shrank from his hand. I didn't dare make any sudden moves for fear that he'd slit her throat or something, something too fast for me to stop. I knew this cute little thing for a long time, before I ever knew you were alive. And whoops, she ends up picking up your pitiful ass after we almost killed you. She turned out to be the strongest connection I had to you. How do you know her? I let my eyes leave his for just a split second, darting down to hers. We work together. Go figure, right? 
I laughed out loud. Wait a second. A shifter with a day job. Who the hell did you piss off? We didn't, as a rule, work with humans. They didn't feel comfortable with us. They barely tolerated us otherwise, but the thought of working alongside us on a daily basis was too much. Shut up, he snarled. No, I mean it. You must have really fucked up to have to get a day job. I laughed, almost genuinely. It was too pathetic. So your clan kicked you out. Is this what you're telling me? Or are you just on probation, and you think this is gonna earn you brownie points with the higher-ups? Is this what's gonna get you back in their good graces? I said shut up. His hand tightened over her shoulder. Rachel cried out. I have news for you, I spat. You're not getting anywhere. You're sure as hell not getting away with this. You think so, he snorted. Yeah. He thinks so. I didn't turn around. I didn't dare take my eyes off those of the East Wing, standing behind Rachel. Then again, I didn't need to turn around to know my brother was standing behind me. I think so too, Damien added. I said alone, the East Wing roared. But I'll take both of you. That's fine. It wasn't fine. He was beyond scared. I could smell it on him just as clearly as I could smell it on Rachel. My smile was grim. You don't like being outnumbered, huh? Not much fun, is it? You would know. He picked Rachel up by her arm and dangled her in the air like she weighed nothing. She screamed and that scream was like a razor cutting me to ribbons. I let out a roar before throwing myself at him hard enough to get him to let go. She hit the floor with a thud. I wanted to check on her, but couldn't risk it. I had other things to take care of. We both fell to the floor, clawing and snapping at each other before we even shifted. I dug my fingers into his throat and was seconds away from tearing it out before he bucked me off him. I hit the nearest wall and slid down until I was on my ass. I heard Rachel scream again. Damien leapt into action and pinned the east wing to the floor while I came to my senses. I couldn't believe my brother would snarl and snap the way I had. His teeth gleamed, his claws razor sharp as he slashed at the east wing, drawing blood. I almost wanted to see how far his rage would take him, but I wanted the pleasure of murdering the bastard myself too. I went to them and crouched over the East Wing's head. You chose the wrong fucking enemies, I growled, before twisting his head until his neck snapped. He went limp. The first thing I registered was the sound of a weak whimper, and I looked up just in time to see Rachel fall back onto the couch in a faint. I went to her, wrapping her in my arms and gently slapping her cheeks with the backs of my fingers. Rachel, baby, wake up. She shook her head, muttering softly. When her eyes fluttered open, I could have wept with relief. He's dead, she whispered. Yeah, baby. He can't hurt you. I was so scared. She dissolved into tears, and I rocked her slowly. Damien paced in tight circles as he made a few phone calls. His total calm, centered attitude was a revelation to me. I didn't know he could come through like that, under pressure. Maybe he was a born leader, after all. I would follow him into battle any day. How is she? He asked after hanging up. She'll be okay. I touched her arm, and she moved it to show it wasn't broken. Otherwise, there wasn't a scratch on her. She'd need time to get over the trauma, but she was physically fine. The body will be out of here soon, Damien said. I just made the arrangements. Vincent has a few ideas on what we should do with this fucker. He spat on the body. Again I was surprised by the strength of his anger. Who was my twin, really? What was he capable of? Thank you, she whispered to him. Thank you for coming. How did you know? He looked at me. We just know. I helped Rachel to her feet and out to the porch. I didn't want her around the body any longer than she needed to be. I can't believe I fell for that guy and his lies, she whispered. He was right too. I knew there was something wrong with him. Something didn't click for us. 
I kept trying to tell myself it was okay, that I was unfairly comparing him to you. But something inside me knew. I should learn to listen to my instincts. She looked up at me, and I took her face in my hands. She had come so close. So close. I might never have seen her again. Life wouldn't be worth living without her. I couldn't imagine how I had lived before the moment I looked into her eyes for the first time. In case I forget to tell you later, I love you. My voice was a soft whisper as I stroked her tear-stained cheeks with my thumbs. I'll always love you. Thank God, she whispered. I was starting to wonder. Did you really have to wonder? I asked with a smile. Come to think of it, no. I love you too, you know. You're never getting rid of me, Tucker Everglade. She smiled too, and we were still wrapped in each other's arms when Jason Cord arrived. Epilogue Rachel What are you going to do with this information? Tucker shrugged. He looked a little lost after I showed him the book Miss Doris had set aside for me. Sure enough, there was a whole passage about the leader of the country's largest clan having started off as a member of its rival clan. I have to make sure it's true that the book is talking specifically about Vincent. It's 30 years old, after all. The information could have been wrong, or it could have been written back before Vincent took over. Only he didn't believe it himself, I could tell. But he wasn't jumping to any conclusions. He would do the responsible thing and make sure he had the right information before telling anybody else. Just another thing I loved about him. It had been a few days since Pierce was killed. He deserved it, of course, but that didn't stop me from feeling guilty whenever hospital administrators asked me if I knew where he was. We were dating, after all, and everybody knew it since he had never been quiet about wanting to go out with me. I told them we had broken up the night before his disappearance, just to throw them off my scent. I got the feeling it was working. I just had to make sure not to react in an obvious way whenever anybody mentioned his name. Tucker was beside me in bed, the library book forgotten on the nightstand. I rested my head on his chest. His heart beat strong and true, and I closed my eyes to enjoy the sound of it. I can't promise you very much right now, he murmured. What do you mean? I mean I want to give you the world. I want to promise you a wedding and a family and a perfect life because you deserve that, and more. That means a lot, I whispered as I planted a kiss against his warm tight peck. I would give you the world. I know you would. And when this is over, I want to marry you. I lifted my head from his chest. What did you just say? I was sure I must have misheard him. I hadn't. He smiled almost shyly. I said, I want to marry you when this is all over. I don't feel like it would be fair to do the whole formal proposal thing now, with so much going on. I don't want you to feel like you're tied down to me if something goes wrong, like if I'm injured or something. I wouldn't want you to feel obligated to go through with anything. Tucker. I sat up stunned. I would stick by you no matter what. I don't need a ring on my finger to commit myself to you. I love you. And I want to marry you too. He took my face in his hands and kissed me, but his expression was serious when he pulled away. Just the same. I want you to be happy, no matter what. I won't tie you down. Too late. You're stuck with me forever. I pulled down the sheet covering his body and feasted my eyes and hands on it as I straddled him. You just like this. He stroked his long thick dick before unrolling a condom. Well, now that you mention it. I sighed as I lowered myself over him, sliding down slowly, enjoying inch by delicious inch as he filled me up. His mouth found my throat and I closed my eyes, wrapping my arms around his shoulders before moving up and down his shaft. I would never get tired of feeling him inside me, or feeling his hands as they roamed over my butt, my thighs, up and down my back as I rotated my hips in a circle while moving up and down. I would never get tired of the almost animal grunts that came from him as I rode, harder, faster, giving in quickly to the passion he woke up in me. I ran my hands through his hair, 
sighing in delight as his tongue lapped at my skin. I love you, he groaned against my throat as our thrust sped up grew more urgent. I love you. I gasped as an orgasm built. When I broke through, still holding him tight, I thanked whatever or whoever had brought us together. Things might not have been perfect, but he was perfect. That was all I needed. I hope you've enjoyed this Ava Benton book. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.